Okay. Hope everyone's doing today uh, well today. Um, yeah, we got some very interesting uh, shit popping off in uh, just in general. You know, we have a lot of updates on healthcare and maid as well. And we have some uh, Alberta updates and how, you know, how fucking dog shit uh, Alberta is falling more and more into a uh, ridiculous rabbit hole. We have the shooting that happened in uh, Van Ha, which, uh, or Van Han, which is not... Uh, not very uh good you ask me like what the fuck is with all these mass shootings nowadays like jesus christ and then we also have uh the liberals claiming uh or making claims about like zero use plastics uh coming into effect on the 20th so yeah, we have a decent amount to to discuss and cover today, so I guess what we can do is like get right into that. So yeah, let's let's do it. Let's start off with the uh, healthcare stuff. All right. Well, healthcare was on the agenda this morning at a coffee shop in Montreal. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met Quebec Premier Francois Legault there after last week's sit-down was postponed by weather. Now, once finished, Legault spoke to reporters and hinted that maybe he's ready to accept one of the federal government's funding conditions. I think that uh, there's a way there. There's a compromise that uh, looks good for everybody. We already publish uh, on a regular basis all kind of data. Uh, uh, and uh, so we have no problem sharing that with the federal government. For months now, doctors and nurses across... It's kind of, like, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting uh, perspective considering that uh, um, provinces like Saskatchewan won't even share, like, any of that shit. Like, even, like, uh, wastewater COVID reporting... Uh, with uh, other government bodies or and nonprofits it's kind of it's kind of different how Quebec handles some things comparative to more west across the country have pleaded for help saying the healthcare system is buckling Dr. Alika Lafontaine is a practicing physician in I wonder why that is It's totally not like we talked about that for like a good 2 3 hours last last time I wonder why that is. Why is that happening? Hmm, I wonder. Grand Prairie, Alberta, and the president of the Canadian Medical Association, and he joins me now. Dr. LaFontaine, you're good with complex diagnosis. How can we have the prime minister saying the strings are still on the table, but the Quebec premier saying he's suddenly more optimistic? How, how do you reconcile uh, th these comments today? You know, I, I think one of the most important things to remember is that patients across the country and providers across the country just want a solution to this problem. And the narrative around the CHT having to be signed before doing any of these things that could fix the healthcare system is probably not a complete narrative. You know, we see advances in Quebec when it comes to data. We know team-based care works very well in places like Alberta with primary care networks. You know, there are these pockets where we are doing the right things. Tying funding to those things that have impact, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I'm pretty excited that there is some talk from premiers about moving forward in this direction, but we'll have to see the action that comes along with it. How, how important is it to get a deal, though, on the Canada Health Transfer? I know you say there are things provinces could do in their jurisdictions with, without a new funding agreement with the federal government, but they seem kind of focused on that, right, as their primary objective. They want this meeting in the new year, and they want to get uh, this deal done. So how important is it, do you think, to, to get the momentum for these reforms? You know, I, I think we see what's important as what's in front of us. You know, what is in front of premiers right now is the funding issue. What's in front of Canadians? It's the deteriorating healthcare system. You know, millions of Canadians can't find a family. I mean, it's totally not like, you know, a lot of these uh, provinces had received 
more than adequate enough funding for a, a vast majority of the uh, problems to to deal with it, right? Um, the main the main issue with that is they don't fucking spend the correct uh, amount of money, if any at all, comparative to say last year's budget. That uh, you know that doesn't solve these problems. Like a, a vast majority of this uh, can be solved if we actually uh, you know fucking spend the money that we're given to go to healthcare and not just piss around and playing politics with this shit. Like, come on, family physician. Millions of health services have been delayed because of the pandemic and other issues. You know, we're having deteriorating conditions that are affecting frontline providers. Patients are waiting almost an entire day to be seen for care. You know, we really can't uh, adopt this narrative that we have to wait for these changes to happen. And some of them are moving <clears throat> forward already. So do we need an injection of funding? Absolutely. But it has to go to the right places. I think the last time you and I spoke was right before the health ministers got together in Vancouver. And that didn't go too well, right? I, I mean, there was a news release calling the meetings a failure before they were even over. And, and it seems like things have been kind of stuck in neutral since then. I mean, what, what's your sense of, of, of just how this has played out at the political level while you and other frontline health professionals are, are, are dealing with this crisis in the system? You know, the, the most frustrating... It, it, it's purely political. That's the only reason on why uh, they're doing this. If... If politics was not an issue with this, I don't, th or wasn't like a big part of this, I honestly don't think that uh, this would have as drastic as uh, of effects uh, comparative to what we're seeing now. I, like, I could 100% be wrong on that, but uh, there is a, a politics aspect to this 100% part of the discussion is we actually know what needs to change you know we have had multiple studies over the last 20 years that have all identified what needs to move forward improving mobility of people across jurisdictions through pan canadian licensure team-based care as a way to maximize the the time that patients can see people for the right things in the right ways you know decreasing the administrative burden on the shoulders of clinicians away to other parts of the system so they have more time to see patients you know these types of things we know we need to move towards Hiring more doctors and medical staff, paying them decently to prevent them uh, uh, from leaving. You know, there's a, a multitude of uh, other different factors that go into that. But most of these, uh, most of these fucking provinces and premiers don't give a shit. Like, they, they would rather just have, like, everyone who's, like, suffering from this be turned into biomatter and keep the way, the way that things are going. Like, it's completely fucking disgusting. And the, and the gall that some fucking morons have, you know, in defending all this is just completely absurd. Having things progress in the way that they have where people are saying you know we have to stop before the funding gets arranged before moving forward with these things that we know can work and have worked you know it, it is frustrating but i'm looking forward to what comes in the new year the best gift that governments can give canadians and providers and patients is to actually get things moving forward and getting these these problems solved but but are there big things th you went, went through a list of things there i mean some of these things are within the provincial power to start dealing with right now i, I mean what are the big things that they're not doing uh, while instead there's this uh, th there's this bit of a showdown happening with the prime minister over funding. You know, I, I think the the biggest problem that's not happening is that people aren't moving into the solutions that we know can solve issues. So, like you said, a lot of these fall within provincial jurisdiction. You know, it is important in the federal provincial discussion to recognize that the federal government's there as a funder and a collaborator. Mm -hmm. Provinces are there to fix healthcare systems, and provinces have always had the power to move forward. With but but they haven't been fixing the healthcare problems though that's the main issue if the provincial jurisdictions actually gave a shit about uh solving these healthcare problems they would not be uh they would not be undermining them and underfunding them 
like if they wanted if they legitimately wanted to solve those problems they would spend every single fucking dime that they have with uh on you know these issues but they don't that's just the reality of it and if they did we wouldn't be in this predicament as uh, as we currently are like it, it's and like it, a, a vast majority of these premiers have also been fairly transparent about it as well Alberta has been transparent about it. Uh, Ontario has been transparent about it. Manitoba has been transparent about it. Uh, Saskatchewan has been transparent about it. Like, need I say more? Like, it, it's it's just literally fucking politics. They're they're literally just playing politics. That's all it is, and it's so fucking annoying. Because we have a bunch of fucking morons running the running the provinces that actually that don't actually give a shit about you know whether you know people fucking die or not, it, it, even like especially like kids that we're seeing right now, because Alberta has been uh, is like at max capacity for for pediatric shit, and. You know, Danielle Smith has been doing nothing about it. And meanwhile, you have kids who are dying from uh, RSV, influenza, COVID, that are sitting in trailers that are like minus fucking 35 and is completely okay with that. And the only reason why the fucking federal government is saying, no, we're not going to be giving you extra money unless you can make a commitment to be spending it on health care is because we know that we can't trust these premiers in order to spend the money correctly. Because what ended up happening with the last uh, federal budget for 2022? They undermined the health care system by not spending enough to it they gave uh, bonuses to their caucus and they gave money to their rich fucking friends to that are investing into privatization of healthcare. it's so fucking frustrating man a lot of these issues you know it is not uh, the narrative is is not that we can't that we have to wait for funding to be in place before we can start moving forward with solutions what do you make of the fact that the Prime Minister has seemingly adopted uh, the use of the, the phrase a broken system? You know, something that you wrote and, and have said in the past that's now been adopted pretty strongly and repeatedly by the Prime Minister sort of uh, to buttress his argument in, in this showdown with the Premier. Are you worried about your being kind of dragged into the middle of this maybe in a way that you weren't intending when you issued that call for reform? You know, I think that statement is something that's heard from providers and patients across the country. You know, when a parent shows up with their child to a place overwhelmed with a pediatric respiratory crisis and they find that they can't get the care that they need or their child has to be transported after admission to another hospital in a different part of the country, you know, it, it's fair and transparent to actually say that the system is broken. But I will say that one thing that I haven't said and that providers across the country aren't saying and that the prime minister did not say is that this can't be fixed. And I think that's the place the conversation has to go. We have solutions. We have things that can fix the system. We have to get to fixing things. So fixing it, though, does come with a cost, right? And, and so it's obvious there is going to be, uh, need to be some sort of extra transfer of cash from the federal government to the provinces to do this. Like, just to use the example of reducing the administrative burden on cl clinicians that you spoke about, that could require hiring administrative people to handle a lot of that stuff. 100%. That, that will go away. So do you have a sense on the, the quantum, to use a word some of the premiers use, on how much money the federal government needs to hand over to the provinces in a renegotiated... I mean, I personally think that they should be spending a little bit more. I don't, however, think that uh, it's going to instantly solve a vast majority of our fucking uh, uh, corruption that we are seeing at the provincial level. Like, it's just not a, it's just not a thing that, uh, you know, that, that's going to happen. 
Like, it, it, it comes in a fucking cycle. If I'm not mistaken, it hap this fucking cycle happens, like, every single, what, like, 20 years or so? Like, you know, we get fucking tired of the liberals for doing jack shit because they're fucking spineless. And then we end up voting uh, for some dickhead conservative who says he's going to be fixing everything. But never actually, actually, uh, never actually fucking does anything. And ends up making things worse. And then the, you know, and then the fucking Canadian citizens, Canadian citizens or whatever fucking province they're from recognize, hey, you know, this is fucking dog shit. We need to get these clowns out of office. And then, you know, the, the cycle continues. Like, this is nothing new. It happens every single fucking time. And, and I'm just sick of it. Canada Health Transfer to start making the serious reforms that you and your colleagues want to see? So I, I think that is one part of the discussion that I will stay out of. What do we know for sure? We know that there needs to be additional funding. It has to be targeted in the right places. And it has to be based off of things that providers are telling governments that we need. You know, the most important part of the medical encounter is not the administrative part. It's not the you know funding part. It's the face time that we actually have with patients so we can make a difference in their lives. And so, you know, do we know that funding has to increase? Absolutely. I think the prime minister has been clear on that. Providers have been clear on that. Premiers are on, pay, on, on side with. I, I do think that there should be the caveat of strings attached, though. I 100% I and, and I'm not the only and the, like, it's not just me that thinks this as well. Um, even like rural conservatives think this too right you know they recognize that uh or, or people recognize that you know the healthcare system is being stripped away from them they're ha experiencing uh worse quality outcomes at the clinic which is psychotic and you know they just want someone to blame right like, don't get me wrong, the fucking liberals suck in this, in this, uh, in this instance, 100%. But I, and many other Canadians think that, uh, the premiers who are causing this hysteria of healthcare and not, you know, doing anything about it is part of the problem. And... You know, we need some accountability for it. But let's be honest with ourselves. None of these fucking premiers are going to be are going to be held accountable for this. And it's and it's ridiculous. With that as well, you know how much that is needed. I, I think that's a discussion I'll leave up to the politicians. So just a, a final point, Doctor. Uh, we talk about the system being in crisis under enormous strain. Um, especially with the, the waves of respiratory viruses that have hit the system throughout the last uh, weeks and months. How much longer do you think the system can endure what's going on uh, before it, it really gets to a point of, I don't know, pandemic? I mean, like, we saw how fucking poor our education system handled COVID. And with the underfunding of uh, the healthcare system currently, and the wave of premiers trying to privatize healthcare, it's just going to make things even more shit, right? Because, like, we're not even at, like, COVID, like, uh, like high COVID levels of uh, influenza, RSV, and, and COVID for just children alone. Like, it, this is ridiculous. And, like, we're already seeing how fucking dog shit the healthcare system is... is uh, keeping up with it because like nurses and other medical staff are quitting on the spot because you know they're not being paid enough they're not uh you know their their demands aren't being met like they're not the the provinces are not willing to bargain with uh with the healthcare workers like it, it's just ridiculous like how many more fucking children have to die before these fucking morons recognize that there's a serious problem going on and they just need to fucking pull up their big boy pants or, or big girl pants and just fucking you know 
get it over with and stop bitching about not having enough funds uh, despite the fact that they have plenty of fucking funds to take care of the, the issue. Like, it's idiotic. Pandemic level sort of crisis. I, I mean, is that something that's in the foreseeable future or is that something that we can... 100%. So I, I think it's happening right now. It depends who you talk to. If you talk to the parent who can't get care for their child, the system has collapsed for that person. If you talk to the family who can't find a family physician, the system's collapsed for that person. If you talk to the nurse or the physician who's now on their second or third overtime or a repeat day of call because there's no one to cover four patients, the system has collapsed. And so we are witnessing a collapse in different parts of the system. One of the frustrating parts of the narrative and making sure people understand, particularly politicians, is that stress always travels downhill and it ends up falling on the shoulders of our frontline and patients. So, you know, I, I recommend to patients across the country, make sure to implement those things that you know worked. In but we've seen time and time again that these politicians don't give a shit. Like, if they actually gave a shit, they would be trying to resolve this problem. But they don't. They are completely fine with overstressed um uh, uh, being overstressed with uh a, a vast majority of the fucking shit that's been going on like they don't care right in previous waves of respiratory illness get vaccinated socially distance if you feel sick uh. you know consider masking as well as other public health interventions and I really advise governments, you know, this will continue to get worse. It will continue to deteriorate. We're on the edge of hopelessness, I think, for a lot of us working on the front line. You know, once we get into indifference, things will get worse. And so we need action now. It is always the most cost effective to work with a crisis as soon as it occurs. So the longer we wait, the more expensive this is going to be. Okay. Dr. Alicia Lafontaine, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. <sighs> Health care was on the agenda today during phone calls between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Quebec and Manitoba Premiers. Facing a crisis in their hospitals, all provincial and territorial leaders are demanding a sit-down with Trudeau in the new year to hash out a funding agreement. Both sides agree more money is needed, but the federal government wants strings attached. Rightfully so. Further increase health care investments through the Canada Health Transfer. In addition, we are ready to invest more in funding through tailor-made agreements with provinces and territories that will allow us to provide better care to Canadians. We owe it to Canadians to come together and find immediate and longer-term solutions to address those challenges. So how much longer can Canadians afford to wait for a health care solution? We're going to ask Dr. Jane Philpott who as health minister helped broker home care and mental health deals with provinces in 2016 and 2017. Jane Philpott is now the dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University. Jane Philpott, I'd like to start off <sighs> with the, the situation between the federal government and the provinces over health care funding, something you've got very specific experience with when you were the minister of health. I mean, is it just a big bulk transfer of cash? Is, is that what the health system needs right now? No. No, I think this, the health system does need more cash for sure, but it needs to be done in a smart way. We, uh, as I've said to you over the years, uh, we spend a lot of money per person on healthcare, but we don't get the best outcomes in the world for that money. We need to invest in, a mu in much smarter ways. And so I think that the feds and the province need to come together and say, yes, let's grow the transfer, but let's do it in a way that's actually going to get delivery for people who are desperately in need of better health systems. I, I remember the last time we had a, a big standoff like this, you were health minister, I think Bill Morneau was finance minister, and you, you found your Brian Gallant and got New Brunswick to break ranks, and then you picked them off province by province. I mean, how, how would you advise uh, Jean-Yves Duclos uh, to, to approach things in the current dynamic? Yeah, I would say that the issue of whether or not all provinces and territories decide at the same moment and sign on mass versus whether it's done piece by piece is probably the less critical issue than the conversation around what is this new money going to buy uh, for the country? And, you know, the country is in a lot worse shape from a health system's point of view than it was at the time that I was uh, health minister in, in that we've gone through this very challenging pandemic time of the last three years and the backlogs are enormous, people are exhausted, the health workforce is 
is, uh, is, is more than decimated. And so it's really important that this money goes to actually see change, that people will finally get access to family doctors and primary care in this country. And that's the kind of thing that the federal government should be buying with their increased investments in, in the provinces and territories. They won't do it, though. How do you, how do you they, they won't do it, though, because the provinces are bitching about not having... Uh, uh, about not getting the money that they need with no strings attached it's clearly because they want to fucking they want more fucking money for themselves and not for the actual healthcare system right like I i'm going to keep hammering this fucking home until morons get this and be like yeah you know what that's actually kind of uh, a bad thing it's literally because they want to privatize the healthcare system because either them or their rich fucking friends have uh, are, are banking on the healthcare si his, uh, system collapsing and people not trusting the public option anymore. We've seen this exact thing happen in America. And like the best way to privatize something, uh, like Noam Chomsky actually did a really good. Uh, 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 bit on this being you know if you want to essentially what he had said is like you know if you want to privatize uh, a system what you need to end up doing is uh, underfunding and undermining the public option because then people will lose trust in uh, the public option and not see it as a viable system anymore and in return, you can privatize that system, allow companies to take over, and make absorbent amounts of money off of it. Buy that if the premiers aren't willing to sell, right? Because they're saying they want uh, this increase and they want no conditions. And, and right now, you can't even get an agreement on who should meet when to talk about why. So how do you move past where we are at this moment? Great question and always easier said than done, but the kinds of things that the federal government is talking about are, are among the smart things. You know, we need to agree that we're gonna share health data in a much better way. We need to agree on a national health workforce strategy. So those things should be fairly easy wins. But we also know that there are other mechanisms that we have, including the way that we've run the Canada Health Act to say, look, you get this money. If you don't deliver access to care, then we're going to claw it back. So why not use that kind of mechanism for us? We should also be holding them responsible for that as well, right? Like, there's no reason why we shouldn't kinds of care like access to family doctors and primary care to say look we'll give you x billion dollars more but if we find that you cannot by you know two years from now three years from now guarantee a family doctor or a primary care provider for everyone in your province then we're, we're going to ask for the money back so you know it's time to have those kinds of difficult conversations and money though as you know is only one part of it it's the supply of family doctors supply of nurses supply of specialists i mean uh, 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 the part in that that or the the way that we can solve that issue is literally by making uh um is by literally making uh education free because i have talked to plenty of different people who said that if they could afford it, they would love to become a doctor. But the thing is, is that due to how expensive it is, they, they aren't able to physically go to school or to post-secondary schooling and, you know, actually do that. It's not like people don't want to. It's just that they can't afford things, especially in this climate. And I know in your role as the dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's University, that's the training ground. For a lot of these people, I, I mean, how does the post-secondary institutions, the health authorities, how, what, how, where do they fit into this in, in terms of innovating or expanding what they offer to fill some of these skill gaps? 
Well, I'm very glad that you asked that because as you said, I am now in the university space and our, our core business is training health professionals. We have here at Queens a School of Medicine, a School of Nursing, a School of Rehabilitation Therapy. So we train the health workforce of the future. We are innovating in really interesting ways that are being well taken up. So for example, we're growing our medical school here. The province gave us new seats for our medical school, but rather than doing business as usual, we're putting those new seats, 20% increase in our class size, into selecting medical students who are committed to family medicine, who will go through a seamless program from their MD degree right through to a family medicine residency and be ready to work out in communities because that's the way they're trained from the start. So there's a lot of really interesting innovation like that happening. Uh, and we've had, as I say, uh, tremendous support. The province is, is uh, really keen about this and we actually think it's going to be one of the, the good solutions out there for addressing the big challenges we're facing. Okay, so just make sure I, I, I got that correct. You got a 20% increase in, 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 in medical school seats but those are reserved for people who are definitely going to do family medicine and then you shoot them right into a pre uh, a residency program when they're ready to go they don't have to shop around i mean how, how mechanically does that work if i got into your med school today in this program how would it work for me so this is truly um uh being designed as we speak okay. so uh you know, you're getting the, the cutting edge news here. Uh, we will still have our main core MD program here on Queen's campus, as we've always done, a fantastic medical school campus here. We're partnering with a part of the province uh, in the Durham region of Ontario with a, a, an organization called Lake Ridge Health uh, as the site for our new campus. And that campus will be devoted to students who specifically say, I want to be a family doctor, not just I want to be a doctor, I want to be a family doctor and they will be put through this program and be able to go right through medical school get their family medicine training they will be heavily embedded in the community from the start and building those relationships with those communities and ready to uh, to provide comprehensive family medicine care when they graduate okay and, and for the record i'm not sure i could get into queens definitely not the medical school but just, just one final point you know the provinces say they need money but you know you, with your understanding of, of the systems i mean are there things that the provinces could be doing right now to, to, to improve things that don't require extra cash from the federal government? 100%. Well, in fact, yes. And, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of where... Ontario alone had $1.6 billion of unspent COVID funds just alone. Uh, like, it's not like they don't have money, you know, lying around or anything that they could 100% be solving these issues with. Where we're spending the money, I'm going to always have my family medicine bias hat on in, in that, you know, this access, lack of access to family doctors and primary care is a huge problem, right? Because ultimately if someone's sick, they're going to need to get care. And if we have now somewhere close to 5 million people in this country that don't have a family doctor, if they're sick, where are they going to go? They're going to end up going to an emergency department. Not the best place to get longitudinal primary care. They provide a great service, but it's meant... It's, it's also how, essentially, healthcare is run in America. Like, a vast majority of people end up going to emergency care to get uh, or emergency or urgent care in order to see a doctor. Uh, mostly because a vast majority of Americans do not have access to uh, a family doctor or can't afford a family doctor. For emergencies, it's a lot more expensive than delivering primary care and it, people don't have a place to come back for follow-up. So trying to divert some of the money that we're spending at the most expensive parts of the health system and moving it into areas that are less expensive but uh, sometimes more effective like primary care or home care, mental health care, all of those things that don't actually cost an enormous amount of money but actually will save us money down the road. So shifting systems, making sure we shift the tasks so that the sometimes the lesser expensive healthcare professional is providing care, so better use of nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, nurses, um, and not always necessarily needing physicians who are uh, a more expensive health professional. Um, those are all the kinds of things that everyone knows needs to be done, and we need uh, provinces and health systems, health authorities to shift in that direction as quickly as possible. 
Okay, James Philpott, always good to talk to you. It's been a while. Thanks so much for joining us today. Nice to Nice to see Keith is here. Samuel Colin spends these days tending to his rescue animals. He has always been a caregiver. Colin trained to be a paramedic at age 19. He wanted medical training in case his I imagine he's probably uh, or they're probably going to talk about like how he's now having to like do checkups and shit on people or, or like, you know, take care of them because, you know, a, a mass amount of people have been quitting in the healthcare industry as well as, you know, Um, uh, people just are just leaving. Father, a severe alcoholic, ever needed help. Now 25, Colin is the one who needs help. He's been at home on mental health leave since September. The Maybe pressure not. has been building on paramedics like him since the pandemic. For quite a while. Well, yeah, like the thing with um, and like uh, I I know this because I've had conversations with both my grandpa and my dad about this people who deal with high stress um environments like say uh, a car accident for example are going to suffer from mental health uh, issues because you know it's very like it's very hard for people to see a lot of that that carnage right and it, it sticks with them. Like, there has, like, like, you know, when people are, like, trapped underneath, the, like, a, a car being pinned to the ground, screaming for help, but, you know, they can't go help them when someone else is not, like, being responsive and everything. It's, uh and their best option is to help them later it, it's heartbreaking right and it, it's just a sad reality because it, you know they know that you're alive and kicking and they don't know if the person unconscious is going to uh is going to be alive uh, like later like or like you know how like someone gets amputated and there uh there isn't a or, or like and some people like especially like new trainees or like newer guys come on and like throw up because they haven't really dealt with this with that situation before uh, if i'm not mistaken i think statistically uh people in the in the first responder uh category and do that and oftentimes do it for uh, do it for volunteering or volunteer work end up getting like terrible fucking PTSD like uh like uh veterans do because they're fairly similar, all things considered. While they were actually using the EMS garages for um, patients to basically be in there on beds because there was no room in the waiting room, there's no room in the hallway, there's no beds available. And we're just be advised, we have no units available. Lots of calls holding. We'll get to this when we can. On one recent day, Regina was fully staffed with 11 ambulances and unable to respond to 135 calls. What? Because of Saskatchewan's backed up healthcare system, many EMS workers find themselves waiting with their patients until they're admitted, unable to respond to calls. This Saskatoon psychiatrist says... That, that seems like it's a little bit of a problem, right? If, if the ambulance drivers and the paramedics can't go out to like a, a crisis that is uh, unfolding to try and save someone's life that's a little bit of a problem right like it, it it it's a problem that can easily be resolved but a, a vast majority of fucking politicians don't give a shit paralyzing paramedics who are trained to help 
leads to mental health issues. Let's put them in the middle of an ER where they're hearing people in distress. They're seeing all the people who aren't getting their needs met. We're inherently making them powerless. The stress has worsened Colin's bipolar disorder. I wasn't sleeping. I would be awake for three or four days at a time uh, when I was off shift. And um, it ruined my life, honestly. Saskatchewan's Ministry of Health tells CBC News it empathizes with the challenging situations EMS workers are facing right now and says it's providing mental health support. Support Colin is using, along with writing out his thoughts, anything to calm his mind. Laura Sharpaletti, CBC News, Regina. Why should it be me? Ketlin Pierre shares one of the lowest points in her life and career as a federal civil servant. One of them is an employee who came to my office and then she drew a, a monkey on my pad and made sure that I knew it was my, my image and I should be cleaning instead of doing management work. I mean, this is just uh, typical fucking racism. Like, it, it's nothing new. This shit has been going on for a while. Um, you know, it's... It's, it, it's idiotic like you have a bunch of dumbass fucking bigots who are like you know oh well if we just you know we should be fucking uh like cleaning and and whatever the fuck which is so idiotic like it, it it's just fucking it, it's just it's a form of eugenics right because despite the fact that, you know, the shit, like, pops off, like, it, it, it literally is. Because, like, people are like, oh, well, you know, they're inferior to us, which is so fucking stupid. Because, like, skin color has nothing to do with how uh, smart one is. Like, it's, it's just fucking racist, right? Pierre says the existing mental health supports like a hotline are not enough to help her and other black employees. The budget documents for 2022. Earlier this year, the Liberals committed to a mental health action plan for black employees. Now, it could be on the verge of falling apart. And a bunch of fucking conservatives pushed back against this, remember? <clears throat> remember that one? It's kind of like conservatives are fucking racist or something. The Federal Black Employee Caucus says it's rethinking its involvement. This after senior Treasury Board officials allegedly questioned the need for a program designed for and led by black employees. CBC News obtained a letter from the group to the Treasury Board. While short on details, it said, We showed up to support the Government of Canada to address anti-black hate within the public service, only to be continuously faced with the crushing weight of it. When I first read this letter, I, it was appalling, shocking. And it's completely idiotic that this is a problem still. Like, it, the fact that a, a bunch of fucking racists are, like, getting away with this shit and, like, nothing's ha nothing changes is, like, ridiculous. <clears throat> shocking. Uh, it was hurtful. A plaintiff in a proposed class action lawsuit brought by black federal government employees says he spoke to workers involved. They tell me how sometimes uh, they were left in tears. They've had to turn off the, the camera on the team's meeting and just break down in tears because of the anti-black racism that they are facing uh, from the senior leaders at, at the Treasury Board. In a statement, the Treasury... I mean, it's, it, it's not just like anti-black racism we've seen we've seen a vast majority of uh racism towards other groups uh climb as well like during and after covid you know uh we've seen a huge spike amongst like uh fucking anti-asian hatred like that's like it's nothing new like uh you know it's nothing new. If you ask, if you talk to someone who is like part of one of these more uh, more marginalized groups, like uh, 
um like like black like a black person you know they say that they uh it, it's more commonplace than people think it is like the anti-black uh racism and and whatnot and then like when it comes to uh uh, when it comes to like the like Asian uh, racism, it's like oh they're fucking diseased or some shit like that. Women have it uh, even harder because they're often seen as like more sex objects, uh, which is psychotic. Like even um like even some of my female Asian friends, you know, uh, uh, had admit this to me like. Yeah, it, it, it's fucking shit, but you know, we're we're seen as like sex like they were seen as sex sex objects and everything, but you know, unfortunately, it's what we have to fucking deal with. Like it, it's so fucking ridiculous, man. Country board says it cannot comment about And like that's not even getting into the whole fucking can of worms uh, about like uh the um the martyrs that uh, are uh are black women like oh my god black women have it so fucking rough because like first of all like they're black so they're all already gonna see like a bunch of fucking discrimination within like the workplace and everything now add being a fucking woman on top of that like it, it's psychotic man it's even fucking worse the mental health program for federal black employees because it's before cabinet. as well as like a vast majority of these marginalized groups also suffer from a vast uh, suffer from uh, mental health illnesses because because of the fucking racism that they have to put up with like it's just psychotic man but it says the federal government is committed to inclusion and diversity david thurton cbc news yeah, I've heard that one before, but when the fuck does that actually happen? All right, uh, so Jugmeet Singh, uh, you know, uh, for those who don't know, Jugmeet Singh uh, said he would not uh, help the vote, uh, help the liberal government get shit passed if it didn't increase uh, federal funding for health care, but. And I fucking screamed at him last time, so let's take a look to see if I'm gonna scream at him this time. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. The battle over healthcare spending between Ottawa and the provinces seems no closer to getting resolved, even as hospitals across the country are under pressure. We're gonna continue uh, to push on provinces to deliver real results for Canadians. We'll be there with investments, but we need to make sure that they're helping Canadians. The Liberal government insists it will contribute more money, but not without better results. We owe it to Canadians to come together and find immediate and longer term solutions to address those challenges. But this week, signs from the government's partner in supply and confidence agreements that the support is not guaranteed without action on health care. If we don't see action on health care, uh, we absolutely preserve the right to withdraw our support. So does the threat to poll support move the needle on the health care issue, or is this a political bluff? Let's bring in our panelists, Chantal Hebert, El Amin Abdul-Mahmoud, Althea Raj, and Andrew Coyne. Good to see everyone. Um, Althea, why don't I start with you this week? What do you make of uh, Jagmeet Singh's positioning on this and, and the realness of this threat? It's not a real threat. Um, it's a way for the NDP leader to get some headlines. Uh, it's a way for the NDP to tell the Liberals that they should not take their support for granted. But the Liberals and the NDP both know that the government is taking their support for granted. <laughs> What's more <laughs> puzzling about this is that usually you come out and you ask for something that you know the other guy's going to give you. Right. In this case, asking, for example, for the Prime Minister to sit down with the Premier is not a realistic ask because there is no deal on the table at the moment. So the PM is not going to meet with the premiers until there is a deal. So why would you ask for something the man cannot give you? Uh, that part is, mo is more troubling to me. Um, but, you know, we've heard from the Bloc Québécois leader this week. Mm -hmm. and we know the Conservatives are not going to support the Liberals. So frankly, you know, if Mr. Singh wants to pull out of these agreements, um, 
who's going to support the budget. And not the NDP, <laughs> certainly not the NDP, not the Liberals, want to have an election. So this is a, an empty threat. I mean, I, I honestly think it's, was, it's an empty threat as well. Because the NDP would look incredibly fucking bad if they actually decided to pull um, support from the Liberal government and uh, and end up uh, calling another federal election. Like it, it looks so. It would look so incredibly bad on them, right? And no, like I was not really too fucking impressed with what he what he said last week. Like that that just pissed me off. Because if I remember correctly, it was like on power and politics, right? Yeah, no, like, let's completely disregard that this he healthcare issue. Like, for the most part, it's being solved on the federal level, but it's not being solved on the provincial level. It's the premiers that are playing gatekeeper. A pure headline for people like us to talk about the NDP. <laughs> Well, that, I guess that's uh, some success then, because that's what we're doing, Chantal. <laughs> yes, well, uh, Mr. Singh is reserving the right to pull his support. He always has that right, so it's yep. reserved uh, permanently. <laughs> that is what the deal is about, <laughs> for one. Two, it would make more sense to say, we're going to pull the rug from under this government uh, because this government is looking to introduce two-tier medicine. Some, some I mean... We already have a two-tier medical system. That's, we wouldn't be changing anything. The only difference is, is that our two-tiered system doesn't, isn't like, you know, for going to see the fucking doctor if you're, you know, your leg gets broken. Our two-tiered system is more akin to, you know, the, say, going to the dentist, going to the physiotherapist, going to the chiropractor, uh, you know, um, getting fucking medication that you need. That's where our two-tiered system is. We have a two-tiered system. It's just not fucking egregious as some other places. But it's slowly becoming more and more fucking shit as time goes on. Um... It's nothing fucking new, though. Uh, like, I, I think we should completely fucking get rid of our two-tiered system altogether and just, like, have every single fucking piece of it covered by our taxes and not have to have an employer who might give you fucking benefits, if you're lucky, up to, like, 80% covered. Something that you yep. can say, I'm an alternative to. Right. But even if we had an election tomorrow uh, about health care, I'm not sure that it would be the ballot box issue. W how do you frame it? The last time the NDP pulled its support from a liberal government over health care issues goes back to Paul Martin. And that brought in a decade of Stephen Harper and I think a lot of new Democrats remember. Mm -hmm. So is it worth then eliminating She's right. the prime minister and the government calling Singh on his bluff? Or do you just let him play it out because, you know, what, what, what's the difference? I mean, I do think you let him play it out, out for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know what, somebody should be concerned with the state of health care system in this country. And it might as well be Jagmeet Singh. I think it's actually good for this country uh, that we have a politician that's talking about this. It doesn't further the NDP's agenda in any sense because it's true, as Althea said, um, the, the reading of this is that it is a bluff. But at the same time, I think people have a long memory and people do remember in, in, a, in a moment of crisis, uh, specifically looking at um, healthcare system in Ontario, for example, in a moment of crisis like this one, I think people do have a memory for saying, I feel like the healthcare system is in crisis and there's only one politician right now on the federal level who's willing to talk about that. And I think that does serve- Yeah, but the unfortunate reality is that the NDP will n most likely never get fucking elected federally. And like, even if they do, okay, what the fuck are they going to do? It's going to be the exact same fucking shit going on with, uh, if we had an NDP government that we're currently facing with a liberal government. So it doesn't even fucking matter. 
mention them, I think, a little bit later, if not right now. Except, Andrew, the, the, uh, the, the government wants to talk about it. They just don't feel like they're getting the conversations that they want to have. Yeah, I, I mean, in fairness to Mr. Singh, uh, the, the NDP, and it's not a coincidental, I think, that this was on the same day uh, as the uh, Mississauga Lakeshore by-election, which I know we're going to talk about later, but where the NDP vote fell to 5%. And he's, I think, in the grip of two things, his party is. One is uh, smaller parties in these types of arrangements typically get forgotten. The government takes credit for their collective achievements, and the, and, and the smaller party doesn't get any. And secondly, this prospect of an election at some point in the near future where it gets very polarized between the conservatives and liberals, which is always bad for the NDP. So he's got to start making differentiation between the NDP and the liberals. He's got to start putting distance between them. He's looking at the potential for an election where health care, I know health care is always talked about as being an issue in an election. This might be an election where it actually is an important issue. Things have gotten to such a hairy extent with the crisis. Look, it's always an issue. The thing is, is it depends on how big of an issue it's going to be. Like, I think this, I think, like, if an, if an election was to be held tomorrow, I think the biggest issue tackled would be the... Rising cl rising costs of uh like food, uh, gas and health and uh, um housing. Healthcare will be one, and then like some other provincial shit. Some healthcare that that people may actually be basing their votes on it, and for all these reasons, I think he's he's got to start putting distance between himself and the liberals, and this may be the start of that campaign. Okay, we're not having an election, though. Yeah, I know. That, that, <laughs> okay. that whole thing made me very worried as well. <laughs> Chantel uh, Delthia. Chantel Delthia, yeah. I've got two words about that. Uh, yeah. Alberta and Manitoba, those two provinces are going to, they are really going to have elections yeah. in 2023. What do they have? Yeah, and Alberta is shaping up to not have another UCP government, which I think is good. And... Uh, Manitoba could go either way. I do think that the NDP in Manitoba have a do actually have a shot of defeating Heather Stephenson, but we'll we'll have to wait and see because she's been playing it smart, or Heather Stephenson has been playing it smart and not uh, like overextending shit. She's outside of like now, realistically. She she's been playing it smart for the most part because she saw what um that last fucking clown did and like the last controversy controversy she had was in like February but you know uh it's just more or less of a wait and see cuz Heather Stephenson is pretty dog shit not going to lie you have in common uh, that the NDP is well placed to form government. So if you're going to want to plunge the country in a federal election at the same time as two key provinces may be falling to your party, you probably have a, a scheduling problem. Oh, I, uh, I'm not saying he's likely to pull the plug at all. I'm just saying rhetorically yes. he needs to distance himself from the liberals. I'm convinced that the liberals will find... I don't think he will, though. Because he's a, in all honesty, he is a fairly uh, conservative NDP member, all things considered. Find a way to be part of the solution on health care long before Canadians head to the polls. Yeah. Well, that, that was sort of my, que my next question. And I'll go to you, for Althea. How does this get unlocked, this, this impasse that we seem to be in? And I don't think that a, a meeting now is going to solve the problems we're dealing with now, to be clear. But how does it get unlocked, do you think? Well, the Prime Minister is meeting with Premier Legault uh, tomorrow. Um, and so we'll see if there is... Uh, baby steps uh, towards something. But at the moment, and we saw this uh, earlier last month when the health ministers were meeting in Vancouver, where even on simple things they cannot agree. I mean, I think, and I, I, I don't want to put this all on the province's back, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's entirely understandable for the federal government to want to have outcomes tied to money. And if it's not outcome... I mean, she's 100% right, though. Like, the it's not unreasonable that the the federal government wants uh, outcomes. And like, 
No, it's completely fair putting it onto the province's back. It 100% is uh, the province's responsibility, and they have not been ke uh, keeping up with their end of the bargain. So, honest, and like, honestly, fuck the premiers. Like, fuck every single last one of them. They've been nothing but dog shit. ...and tied to money, then it's tax point. But then don't come begging for more money after. And so the provinces keep to want keep wanting to have it both ways. And I, I think the public, at some point, you know, you're looking at a bunch of provinces that are sitting on surpluses. Why is the state True. of health care where it is? I mean, that is not Justin Trudeau's fault. That is... Hmm, I wonder why. I wonder why that is. Why is that? I wonder. Hmm. Hmm. That's, uh, that's crazy. I, I can't think of a single, a single reason on why uh that is why why are these provinces most of these provinces sitting on a surplus of money begging for money while uh the healthcare system is uh starting to collapse in and of itself i wonder why that is is a lack of investment from the provinces some provinces like ontario did not even use all the money the federal government gave them during covid and so, yes, one point eight billion the federal government to play. I generally or one point six billion, sorry, to play a large role. But at some point, the provinces need to agree that what Ottawa is asking for is not the end of the world. Like common metrics, so that we can verify and measure outcomes. That is not asking too much. But the it, problem, it, to, yeah, to me, the, yeah. for me, the problem is isn't that. The problem is that right now, while the system is sort of in the throes of this crisis it looks like the federal government is nowhere on this. And I think that is a sort of a more pressing what? kind of storm. If they can weather this storm, the storm of this winter in the healthcare system, then certainly they can make that argument that actually does not fall on them. The Liberals can make that argument. But while they're in the middle of the storm, I think there's a, 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 a I'm not sure that it reads very well to people mm. that the Liberals are not as engaged in the healthcare debate as maybe they should be. Well, there's a lot of stuff happening. They, they are engaged in it, though. It's not like they're not engaged in it. They 100% are. It's just that you have a bunch of these fucking idiots crying that they're not receiving enough money uh, for the healthcare system, but there's, for the most part, they're sitting on uh, a surplus of of cash, but they're not doing anything about, uh, with it though. That's the biggest issue. Like, honestly, the Liberals have, like, for the most part, the Liberals have been doing a fairly, have been doing fairly uh, good, all things considered. Like, they would be doing the exact same fucking thing as the uh, NDP would, for the most part. ...in the background yeah. that we don't see because sure. it's not announceable yet. Yeah, uh, and, and the other problem is, suppose that in the spirit of Christmas they all meet next week <laughs> and they all <laughs> sing together. Do you think for one second that that, that will advance or solve any of the structural issues? No, no it 100% won't. In fact, it, if it was to all happen at the same fucking time, I honestly think it could actually make things worse. Be and like we would continue with the same fucking shit that we're dealing with now. It will make this winter a really bad winter in the no. healthcare system no. because it ain't gonna yeah. happen. That's yeah. exactly right. It, it, we have to distinguish between solving a short-term political problem for the federal government, or for the provinces for that matter, by striking quote-unquote a deal, and actually changing anything in the health system. That's going to require much more fundamental reforms at the provincial level and much more fundamental changes to fiscal transfer arrangements. As long as the feds continue to send them cash, whether it has strings attached or not, we're still going to have the blame game. We're still going to have them pointing fingers at each other. He's right. In place of actually making the hard and difficult reforms that are going to be need needed to make He's right. work better. He he's 100% right about that. They're literally just going to be fucking pointing the fingers uh, at each other, not solving the issue, and, you know, completely, like, fuck over the rest of the Canadians. This week saw the Mississauga Lakeshore by-election results with Liberal MP... Okay, uh, I don't really feel like talking about that.
I am very proud to be here today with so Ontario uh, for those who don't know Ontario is uh, having problems with a, a bill that was passed or is in the works I don't remember exactly um, but essentially it's going to affect a lot of uh, healthcare workers so let's take a look it's all of our allies to present this Christmas card to our premier we represent all I, I have seen this floating around on social media a little bit this card 68,000 frontline nurses and healthcare professionals and 18,000 nursing students across this province the vast majority of our members have been affected by bill 124 our health care system is collapsing there's no end in sight emergency departments are closing all across the province surgeries are being cancelled and children are unable to be admitted to hospital when they need it because of the shortage of staffing and are dying Ontario's nurses are tired, stressed, and overwhelmed with the serious staffing shortage, the negativity, and all of this is impacting patient care. There was a glimmer of hope, though, when the court decision on Bill 124 was announced in November, nurses and health care workers were overjoyed. We were finally vindicated seeing this terrible legislation struck down. Nurses cheered and literally breathed a sigh of relief. Relief that we can finally seek the wages we are owed. Relief that our... Th the sad thing is that I don't think that they're actually going to get all their uh, the wages that they're owed. I think at best they'll probably get like half. Which is very fucking... Uh, sad because we've seen how demonstrably fucking uh, psychopathic Doug Ford has been. Three year fight for fairness and respect was a victory. Unfortunately, this relief was short lived. Yep. The Ford government quickly expressed their intent to appeal. Nurses went from relief to outrage. As they, they should are be. Angry. We are frustrated, and we are saying enough is enough. We urge the Ford government to do the right thing. And the right thing for nurses and health care workers and all public sector workers <clears throat> is the right thing for patients and Ontario taxpayers. Do not appeal the court ruling. Bill 124, no more. The premier must stop attacking workers. This is vital. Yeah, like remember last month when he decided he was going to be attacking uh, uh, education workers and now he's attacking healthcare workers? Yeah, that totally worked out well for him uh, with uh, the QP strikes, right? The premier must stop targeting female dominated professions like nurses, healthcare workers, and teachers. The Premier must not move forward with an appeal. It's time for our Premier to do the right thing and to stop this appeal. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. My name is Michael Hurley, and I'm uh, the president of QP's Ontario Council of Hospital Unions. Let's go, and, QP. Uh, we're here today to deliver a, pr a postcard to Premier Ford. Uh, I doubt he's going to come down for it. He's been asked to, but it, it says, Dear Premier, do not appeal Bill 124. And we're delivering this on behalf of the 295,000 hospital workers, healthcare workers that we represent. In not not going to lie, that's a really corny thing to do. Like, it, it's just really corny. But like, I, I get why they why they're doing it though. Ontario, people who've worked tirelessly through the pandemic. We have a government that denied that COVID was airborne, withheld vital protective equipment from these 
from these workers. We have a hospital system which has 33,000 vacancies and turns over 15,000 positions a year according to the Canadian Institute for Healthcare Information, which is causing a staffing crisis, which is causing a capacity crisis in our hospitals, and it won't be remedied as long as the staff are treated without the respect that they deserve. The courts have spoken on Bill 124. The bill has been found to be unconstitutional. It is our expectation. I mean, that doesn't matter, though. He literally fucking passed uh, the other bill uh, for education workers, though. He doesn't give a shit if something's unconstitutional or not. Like, remember how, how like, the courts ruled it was unconstitutional for him to pass the the bill against them and uh, the courts are like no that's un unconstitutional it was literally because he had the fucking notwithstanding clause in there and was being a complete fucking psychopath about it but now the government will respect the court decision and they will don't not appeal and uh that's certainly the intent that we uh that we have as we present this card to the premier and to his cabinet today thank you so much i want you to listen to something um what is unfortunately a very common problem my name is carlene my husband and i we've gone without a family doctor for about two years my name is Allie Ballin, and I've been looking for a family doctor for about four years, since 2019. I, I got so desperate at one point, I called every physician that practices in our city. I am visually impaired, I am not able to drive. Taking the bus to another city when I'm not feeling well is not, not really appropriate, nor great for me. Every office that I've called to inquire about has put me on a wait list. I have not moved up on any of the offices. Now, according to a recent uh, Angus Reid survey, close to 20%, so one in five Canadians, do not have a family doctor. So, like, where do they go when they need medical attention, right? Well, well the way I see it, you know, they have three main options. One, go to a walk-in clinic. Two, go to a hospital. Or three, go it alone. Now, for almost my entire adult life, so from, you know, Montreal to Vancouver to Toronto, I've fallen into that first category. So I, I basically see whichever doctor will see me at whatever clinic is open. Because I mean, yeah, and like, it's not just him uh, either. Like, for the most part, it's uh, the exact same thing. Like, generally speaking, you'll, you'll tend to see the first uh, doctor that's willing to see you. Finding a family doctor is just hard. Because I remember when I saw a, um, or I remember when I had uh, issues with my ear a couple months ago, I, I had that problem. Heard, right? We just heard it. But today we're going to do two things. We're going to hear from a family doctor about why it's well worth the trouble to find one. And, and maybe for reasons that you haven't thought of. But we're also going to take a closer look at a truly comprehensive healthcare solution that has been in development in this country for nearly 20 years, but that most Canadians don't have access to. And that until recently, oops, comprehensive healthcare solution that has been in development in and for the most part has been uh, only enacted with if it has been with more uh, white suburbanites this country for nearly 20 years but that most canadians don't have access to and that until recently i'm embarrassed to say i never even heard of but first we have invited dr danielle martin family physician to join us here in studio uh, to, to help walk us through kind of what we're missing when we don't have access to this pretty fundamental like continuum right of of care primary care and first of all how are you doing i'm great nice <laughs> to see you <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here so full disclosure okay so let me set this up this way i'm a walk-in clinic guy okay <laughs> so, <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i know i know that hurts um but like it's actually kind of worked out okay for mm -hmm. me right like i 
you know, get my prescriptions filled just fine. Like I have asthma, eczema, whatever. I can get EpiPens mm -hmm. when I need them. Um, you know, like I've got a little bit of a like a rickety shoulder, mm -hmm. but you know, and maybe some crackly knees. But but like that's just because I'm getting old, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that big of a deal. Tell me, what am I missing? Yeah, I mean, first of all, what you're expressing is that you value the convenience of the walk-in clinic, yeah. and I agree that you're entitled to that convenience, and that uh, we need to try to build models of family medicine and primary care that uh, respect your time. Um, and where you can access what you need easily. 100%. But a walk-in clinic doctor is not going to have time or uh, relationship with you over time. But they have to my notice. records, right? They no, they, no, they really don't. And they're not shared. They're, if they have them, they're not. it's not their obligation. To, they're treating every interaction, that's a walk-in clinic, as a one-off interaction. They are not taking responsibility for your ongoing care. So they're not going to step back and say, did you know, Andrew, that actually asthma and eczema are linked? Mm -hmm. And that actually that puts your kids at risk of certain kinds of other allergy uh, related uh, issues over time. Or that, that actually maybe that rickety shoulder and that rash are linked and perhaps it's not eczema. Your family doctor knows you. They don't specialize in a disease or an illness or an organ or a body part. They specialize in their relationship with you. And they will notice that your blood pressure is creeping up. They will help you to prevent yourself from getting sick by doing the regular monitoring. For and that's why, like, routine checkups and uh, and follow-ups are so important, right? Especially with uh, a family uh, a family doctor, because the thing is, is that they have all your records and everything, and they will be able to keep an eye out on that stuff. And then they can be like, hey, you know, this is happening and all that. Let you know what the corrective uh, solution is and point you in the right direction. For chronic diseases, have we checked your cholesterol? Have we, are we keeping an eye on your blood pressure? What was your family history again? You know, what did your mom have? Do we need to screen you early for certain forms of cancer? And recognize the interplay over time and space of what is happening in your life, what's happening in your body, what's happening in the community around you that affects your health, that's our job. It, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that that family doctors are, are not only exceptionally good at, at noticing things, but but noticing patterns. I patterns guess, too, is what right? it's about, and, and, and the specialty really is about relationships. So if I've never met you before, I might not say, you put on a bit of weight or whatever, <laughs> you know? Uh, like, yeah, and like the thing is, is like, Another thing is is that people also don't necessarily trust like their family physicians either. Like especially like fucking like uh skeptics in uh the healthcare uh with uh with healthcare like say vaccines for example. Like the thing is is I I trust my doctor like my my family doctor a lot. Right, like if I'm, I have no problem with like scheduling appointments to to go see my family doctor. I I enjoy my family doctor. I think he's great. But, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think it's you know it's noticing change over time, so patterns in the individual as well as patterns of symptoms and at the level of the population. But I might also say you know. I'm wondering if there's a link to what you're, what you're eating here. Maybe we should get you connected with a dietitian. Or um, every time you come in here with an exacerbation, it's because you're under mental stress. It's time for us to connect you with a therapist. So it's not. And like for me, when I uh, when I started off having knee problems, uh, my family doctor, my family medicine doctor, had told me to. Uh, uh, go see a physiotherapist, which is exactly what I did. Not just referrals to medical specialists, it's the full range yeah, of see, that surprises healthcare me. providers like I, out there. I normally think of doctors referring people to other doctors, right? To other specialists. But we refer but to social workers, to psychologists, right. to pharmacists, to dietitians, to, the, you know, to uh, uh, physiotherapists and occupational therapists. So, you know, uh, helping to determine who is the right professional, the right healthcare provider, to support you 
um, is a big part of what we do in family medicine. So why is it so damn hard to find a family Oh, doctor? it's so <laughs> hard, I know, and it's such a, it's such a tough problem. I mean, some of it is because um, our population in Canada is growing, but it's also aging, which means the family docs are aging. Oh, and so themselves, we've, retiring themselves and, and retiring. So we've seen, then add the pandemic to that. So we've seen a doubling of retirements during the pandemic and here in Ontario. But those doctors aren't being Not, replaced. It's impossible to replace them at a fast enough pace. A, a, a problem with that is also like, you know, again, people want to become doctor, uh, things like say doctors and everything, but they can't afford to go, uh, to, go to school for it. It's not like people don't want to become, it's not like younger people don't want to become doctors or anything. No, there are plenty of uh, enthusiastic uh, young people who want to become doctors. It's just that the the rate of schooling and the rate of, and the, like, the cost of living is completely outrageous. And, like, what, they might be able to pay off, or it might take them, like, what, fucking 30 years? Or, well, that's actually lowballing it might take them like 50 years to like pay off their fucking school loan and potentially get a fucking job in that field if they even want to consider considering the current state of our uh, of our healthcare system so there's that and that's not an exaggeration by the way at the outset of the pandemic during a, a six or seven month period we saw 385 doctors stop practicing this is according to a recent study in the Annals of Family Medicine. And that number is about double the number of doctors that we typically see retire during that same period of time every year between 2010 and 2019. That's 170,000 people who just lost their GP. And part of that is also because the practice has shifted. The new generation want to work in a much more supportive environment. They want to work in teams. And a team means multiple doctors working together but it also means multiple doctors working together with nurses and pharmacists and social workers and all of those other but what do you healthcare mean? Like, providers. So all, all of these doctors under one Un roof? Sometimes under one roof. Sometimes it's more of a, you know, we're in the same neighborhood and we share calls. So I'm all True. For 100%. Because, like, uh, when I had to uh, get physiotherapy and everything, I had asked my doctor, like, hey, is there any... Uh, is there like any good physiotherapist in, in the area that you can recommend me to? And he's like, for sure. Uh, just uh, th there's one right down the street. You can go there, and they generally have pretty good, uh, pretty good services. I'm like, awesome. I'll go there. I'll, I'll go there tomorrow and set up, uh, set up some stuff. And yeah, I do like uh i did like going there and i liked my physiotherapist as well if i had any other problems that i needed to go to physiotherapy for i would gladly go there again allowed to take a vacation but somebody's got to take care of you while i'm away right. my colleague steps in so it's it's about cross coverage and it's about all of these other kinds of providers so that i have a an uh, elder who's taking eight medications and now they've got COVID and I got to put them on Paxlovid, which is a medication that has a million drug interactions. Rather than spending my whole afternoon trying to figure out what to do, I pass that person to the pharmacist and the pharmacist knows how to figure out what to, you know, what to hold, what to discontinue, how to adjust doses of things, True. get them on the Paxlovid, help me with the prescription and I can move on and see the next person. So it's teams and we haven't been building the teams for our new grads to come into. So and people are choosing family medicine. Right, and, and yet, and, and I just want this to be clear for folks who are listening to you talk about this sort of team-based approach. This isn't just like an idea that someone no, has. No, no, this, this is, is a thing. About a third of Ontarians have access to a team right now, either through a community health center or a family health team. And that's just in Ontario. Th those numbers are lower in some other provinces and territories. And yet here I am, in, in not just in Ontario, but in the biggest, you know, most populous city in the country, with not able to find a single family doctor, right. never, never mind the, the team-based approach right. that you're talking about. So we're going to have to, I mean, we don't bat an eyelash when we have to spend a billion dollars to build a bunch of new hospitals and fancy buildings. We are going to have to invest 
in primary care in this country we know and, and we but we do bat an eye when it comes to like actually paying those workers to uh stick around like it, it's so fucking stupid man like why is that such a big thing like if you want if you want this team-based approach for one you gotta treat the fucking uh medical staff with a huge amount of respect that unfortunately a lot of the governments haven't been doing <coughs> and uh you know um actually listening to what they have to say uh about and like what needs to improve like which aspects need to improve and like you know, getting their second opinions on on shit. Oh, that health systems that are built on fund a strong foundation of primary care have better health outcomes for patients, better equity, True. and lower costs. You don't end up in the hospital with a stroke if your family doctor has been seeing you and managing your blood pressure. You don't end up with an, a, a, a late stage cancer if you've been getting your regular screening. So primary care more than pays for itself. But we just keep investing in the fix it shop which is the hospital, um, and under-investing in the community. So I'm not talking about paying family doctors more for their individual work. I'm talking about building those... Despite the fact that they should be paid more. ...to make it attractive for new graduates to choose... I mean, the, the money aspect definitely is a, uh, a way for uh, people to choose the, uh, choose that stuff, for sure. Like, whether we'd like to admit it or not, like, people are, are self-motivated and driven by uh, their own desires. And, like, in a world where the cost of everything is going up, yeah, that's something that people are going to be taking a look at, right? Family medicine and to provide this kind of care. Because you're right, otherwise, we end up in a situation where people use walk-in clinics and, you know, it can be convenient and fine when you're young and healthy, but every investment of a visit that you make with a person who knows you will pay you dividends later uh, when you need when you need healthcare, which you know if we're lucky enough to live long enough, we're all going to need. Dr. Martin, thank you so much. Thank you. We have a lot to talk about uh, on the other side of the break. More on this this team based approach. Okay, so I'm here outside the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center, I exactly the kind of place that Dr. Martin was talking about just before the commercial break, because we figured the best way for me to learn more about what goes on inside is to actually just go inside. And I know my producer, Drew, has something uh, that he's cooked up once I get in. Okay, let's go. Right. So what are we doing here? Uh, we're going to take you on a patient journey at this health team. Mic'd up, you can hear me, one, two, one, two, all good? So this is, this is a reimagining of who I am today. That's <laughs> right. Okay, That's got right. it. Okay, let's head on down. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. Yep. Okay, let's see this. Hello? Come on in, come on in, Angela. Hey, Angela. Hello. Can you tell me about this place where so, we're at? So this is a community health center, um, Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center. Um, and we are one of um, over 70 community health centers across Ontario. In addition to the physicians, we have nurses, nurse practitioners, which are the advanced practice nurses, yeah. and we have physiotherapists, we have social workers, high need populations, um, so therefore you have complex health conditions that people have that is also compli complicated by social determinants, poverty issues. I have a feeling that there are some complex conditions yes, in this there envelope. Is. Should yes. I, is this a good time Please to, op should I open Please this? Do. Okay, so I'll just read this out loud. You are a 50 year old man. You live on social assistance because you sustained an injury at work 10 years ago and haven't been able to work since. Recently, you started to experience frequent urination and you're losing more weight than usual. You live alone and don't eat as healthy as you know you should. Mm -hmm. If I walked into this health center mm -hmm. with this <laughs> series of, of medical issues, uh -huh. what happens? 
So what would happen is um, the first person who you would come upon likely and be directed to would be the our intake worker, okay. which would be someone who would take you know your you know the details, yep. and then they will use that to then connect you to the right care provider. And who is the right care provider? The in this first case? right care provider, given what you have there as your condition, would be a nurse practitioner and or a physician. Can we go? So we can definitely take I'll you to the you. nurse practitioner. Hi there. Hi, Hi, Andrew. I'm Shona. Nice yeah. to meet you. So I'm coming in here with a whole host of, of issues that I'm struggling with. And, and maybe the most acute one would be this frequent urination. So I have to pee a lot more than I used to and losing weight. He's, does that, does he's that just getting old, brother. <laughs> trigger alarm bells? Absolutely. One of the things that we worry about when someone would come in with um, peeing a lot, losing weight, first thing you think of is diabetes. And so what would diabetes, you Diabetes, yikes. So um, I would take a bit more of a history. I'd work out if they had any other symptoms. I would order some blood work because we can diagnose from a really simple blood test. Doesn't even have to be fasting. We can even do that here. I would connect you to our diabetes team. So diabetes nurse educator and dietitian who would work with you around um, learning about diabetes, any sort of lifestyle measures that you could take. And can we have them come She's in? actually here today, okay. so I can go and bring her in. Her name is Jane. Wonderful, okay, I'll, I'll wait here. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, so just as I wait for uh, Jane, the registered nurse and, and diabetes educator, to arrive here, I'm struck by something that Shona mentioned as she was leaving. And the thing is, is that like, if we actually had more systems like this in place in uh, in the country, like, uh, I think it would be really beneficial to uh, to vast majority of of Canadians, right? And like, I don't know why, but like. Just seeing how like friendly the uh, uh, like the nurse practitioner is and the um, the intake uh, personnel was like it's really I don't know it just makes me uh, wish we had more of these. She was saying that this case study that I've got here, you know, being a 50-year-old man on social assistance, frequent urination, losing weight, not eating as healthily as I perhaps should, she said that this is actually a remarkably straightforward case for them, that usually they handle much more complex cases, sometimes involving things like substance abuse or mental health illnesses. So this is something that they seem pretty well equipped to handle here. Hi, Jane. Hi, How are nice you? to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. You're a diabetes educator. Yes. What is it that you and I would be having a conversation about at, at this point after I've done some blood work and I've sort of confirmed the worst? A lot of it is talking about what their treatment is going to be. So okay. if they don't want to go on the route of starting any medications, then we look at lifestyle for at least three months. And if the lifestyle alone hasn't, we keep it in the back of our minds that, you know, we may have to add some things to your treatment. What might be a logical next step from there? Is a case manager. Okay. Yeah, a case manager would be helpful for you in your particular case because you've been unemployed for a while, you live alone, um, you're on social assistance, so those are all the social determinants of health that can impact how you manage your diabetes. Can you introduce me to that Absolutely. person? Absolutely. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so let's go. <laughs> Oh, Hi, Tandy. Hi, Tandy. I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Keep in mind that this is how it, like, healthcare would probably be if, uh, if the province is actually invested into healthcare. Let's keep that in mind. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you. Thank you so much. Instead of bickering about, like, uh, receiving more money for healthcare, not spending that money on healthcare. Okay. Mm -hmm. What goes through your mind as you as you see those? Somebody things? that needs a lot of support to get to a place where they're healthy and they're empowered around their health. So I see things around uh, food insecurity. Right. So if you're not having adequate food, how can you stay healthy? How would you help me on that? Front? Oh, I would introduce you to one of the team on the first floor that would help you with food resources, food banks. Sometimes we get donations of fresh food. I mean, medically, I, I suspect at some point I would actually need to sit with a medical doctor. Yep. 
Yep, so then you would also be referred to Dr. Gillis, uh, who's one of our physicians here. Can you introduce me to Dr. Gillis? Absolutely, okay. I'd love to. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Hi, it's Hi. nice to meet you. I'm Allison Gillies. Okay, so uh, this has been a whirlwind <laughs> so far. So after I've had a conversation with someone like Pandy, uh, a case work manager, what would our conversation be like? So for in the case that's being discussed today, so for example, co someone coming in with new diabetes, yeah. um, I'd be wanting to you know get a sense of what the symptoms are, um, <laughs> making sure that we're doing a physical exam, checking the blood pressure, seeing if there's any nerve damage from the sugars having been high, there's screening that needs to be done, eye screening, for example, uh, because the bl high blood sugars can cause damage to the eyes. Right, right. So it would be coordinating those tests and then arranging follow-up based on the results of those findings. So if everything is going really well and, and things are well controlled, I might be seeing you again in three months. If the results are coming back in a level that is more concerning, I might be seeing you again in two weeks. D uh, Dr. Gillies, thank you so much for this. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Angela, uh, this, this place is incredible. Thank you. Um, I'm struck by just the diversity of expertise uh -huh. in this building. It seems to me like you're, you're really looking at the whole person. The whole person, the whole person. And okay. how closely are all of the, the professionals in this building working with each other? Like, are, like are, they, are they consulting each other often when they share patients? Yes, so, um, so we are all part of the circle of care. So it means that if you see a physician, then that physician can easily chart something in the clinical record, in the client record, and the social worker can pick up on that to follow through with what is um, being requested on the part of the clinical team. What kind of financial pressures are there on you to, to churn through patients as quickly as possible? Like, like I'm, tr I'm looking at this place and I'm trying to think, is this more like, a shopping mall or an assembly line? Ah, I would say that it is a lovely food court <laughs> <laughs> in that you mm. have a range of offerings um, in a single setting and that you are directed to the stations which best meet your needs. Mm. Um, in terms of resourcing and the churning, is because we're in a salaried model, um, it means then if you need some more time, then the provider can spend more time with you without right. it becoming a, an impact on billing. There's no one or two issues per visit. No. Here, the, no. The, 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 right? There's there's no requirement to just push people through yes. as quickly as possible. Yes. If someone needs, if someone has six, eight issues. You then we have the ability to deal with um, six or eight, but it also means that the pressure isn't on one single provider mm. to respond to the six or eight needs. Right. That right. single provider may have uh, four other people that they can draw on to support and again, encircle the client. Because otherwise, if such a person did not have access to a place such as this, how would they manage? Um, well, I think in the absence of team-based care, then an individual who is marginalized, who is already facing challenges, and or even, you know, you're a person who is relatively settled and stable, mm -hmm. can spend a lot of time, what I call hopscotching, mm. within a system to find the care. And particularly for folks who may be in a workplace where they don't get time off to go to a myriad of appointments, then being in a space where you can be attached to multiple services i mean uh, th for the most part that's a vast majority of people nowadays right uh, especially in like especially for younger people because generally speaking a vast majority of younger people uh if they're, if they're like living on their own they have to work like two jobs right it's a lot sometimes in a single visit just to come to one place it's easier right. it is easier so so angela w why isn't there one of these places on every street corner in every neighborhood in every province across this country well you know you're saying what is my desire <laughs> <laughs> um I, I think it does have I, I think costs are a part of that but i don't think that's as big as a problem as people think it is 
Um, another part of it would have to be like a lack of uh, education on systems like this, especially like more on the uh, the provincial level, and as well as like provincial governments not actually wanting to enact policies or changes to have uh, institutions like this. Um, you're saying what is my desire, and I would say that um, these kinds of integrated care services can sometimes be seen as the, by, by the system as an expensive model. Right. And I think when... I mean, the, the way that are, uh, like... Currently, that w the way that like the healthcare uh, is provided is seen as an expensive model, despite the fact that I honestly th like it, I, I could be wrong on this, but I actually think that a, a model like this compared to everyone having to go to like the ER or like the hospital or a clinic or something like that would be. Uh, just as uh, expensive if not a little bit more cheaper to do a system like this compared to what we're currently doing right look at the expense that you would spend in building this kind of team-based care versus the expense that you will spend yo wait what no no shot Trump released his tax returns? Bro, that's crazy. What are in them? Setting, responding to what happens in the absence of this kind of team-based care is you'll spend more. You'll spend more in the acute care responding to the emergencies created by the absence of team-based care. Right. And that's a high ticket item. And I'm saying, no, more beds might be needed. What we have may be imperfect, but certainly Yo. more investment should be placed at the genesis of the site of need, which is in community and team-based care, mm -hmm. and bringing care also closer to where people are. Angela, you've been exceedingly generous with your time, your expertise, and, and your team. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Bro, the more I see of, like, uh, institutions like this the more I'm uh, the more I think is like the more I ask like why the fuck don't we do this more right uh, why don't we just stop fucking playing around uh, with people's well-being and health and just invest into shit like this instead of bitching and moaning about like how dog shit the current system is and you know actually fucking invest in people and not try to fucking privatize everything hey welcome back to about that so so hey that that was like genuinely cool to be there at the uh, parkdale queen west community health center uh big props to uh to angela and company for showing us around thank you for that and you know th this is something that exists in other places too there there are apparently dozens of such community health centers in ontario Although about a quarter of Ontarians have access to a community health center, which is criminal. And, and you know, I just think of myself. I mean, in my case, I've you know been on this planet for for nearly four decades, and I have never encountered this sort of thing until starting to do this story. And I've lived in four major cities, right? Um, Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver, and Toronto. Although, uh, what I'm told is that for these particular types of community health centers, they do tend to be more prevalent in rural areas that yep. you might find in that, uh, urban areas this that is that is true it is uh like i live in more of a rural area so yeah it we uh we definitely do have one like our main clinic here is more so focused to this like we have we, we can like when we go see a, a family physician we can go s like they'll refer us to like you know, uh, to the pharmacist or to physiotherapy or a chiropractor or whatever. It's definitely a lot harder for those in uh, more urban areas, for sure, to to have something like this, for sure. 
this kind of team-based care. But hey, it's interesting, right? And, and if, if what Daniel Martin said was true, that there is a problem in trying to refill all of those positions in general medicine, in family medicine, that were vacated during the pandemic, interesting to think that maybe this is, provides sort of a, an attractive workspace for folks to get into this type of medicine. All right, so let's talk about, uh, let's read some articles and then we'll move on to MAID. Um, major viruses are impacting Canada's uh, health systems a, and a shortage of staff at a critical time is being uh, exacerbated by poor working conditions for the lowest paid in the healthcare sector, several physicians and academics told CTV news.ca. Those conditions include a lack of permanent paid sick days, and it's only f uh, fueling workers' desire to leave the field, they said. I mean, this and uh, like the lack of permanent paid sick days and the uh and the under uh f uh like the low low pay wage and the poor working conditions are just some of the multitude of different reasons of why people are leaving the the healthcare sector because you know if you want to it's it's just because they're trying to fucking privatize healthcare, man. Um, when the pandemic led to lockdowns across Canada in March 2020, and two only two provinces offered any kind of permanent sick uh, sick days, Prince Edward Island provided one sick day, and Quebec provided two. Since then, BC has uh, added been added to the mix. In January, it legislated that five permanent paid sick days be provided to all workers other provinces have offered paid sick leave but when uh, they are temporary policies Im implanted due to the pandemic that come with an, exp uh, an expiry date which I think is just fucking stupid right Kwame McKenzie CEO of the Toronto based health equality or Equity Policy Group, uh, Wells Wellesley Institute said it's very worrying that permanent paid sick days are not available for these workers, especially at this point in the pandemic. Uh, quote: We do not seem, we don't seem to have learned the lessons from pandemics, and we ha know that not having sick days caused problems. People went to work sick and they passed on COVID-19 to others, making workplaces hazardous, he said in an interview with CTV News. Not having access to paid uh, sick days prevented people from getting vaccinated, he said. It also meant people didn't want to be tested because they thought if I test positive, that's a problem because I may, I, because maybe I won't be able to pay rent, he said. Now, amidst RS, RSV and flu, well, and while COVID-19 is still spreading, we have a triple threat occurring, he said. Uh, having paid sick days is a triple imp uh, imperative. Instead of having, instead of a single imperative, McKenzie said, while hospitals uh, overwhelmed uh, academics and public health experts say governments across the country missed another opportunity to ensure the most valuable workers are protected, uh, keeping patients safe, and retaining healthcare staff. Personal support workers, uh, Daniela uh, works at two long-term care homes in Toronto. CTV News is uh, granting Daniela anonymity 
due to fears uh, they could face punishment for work at work, which is just fucking stupid. Uh, they immigrated from Colombia in 2018 and was starting from scratch when they arrived to, in Canada. Uh, Daniela said in a phone interview, uh, when they first moved, Daniela was cleaning homes, but then decided to take a course to become a PSW alo uh, along with learning English at the same time. Uh, they said it's not just themselves that they ha uh, have to provide for. Well, I'm living with my partner here, and I have to send money back to my mother. I have to support her. Which, you know, it's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, with people to support and the inflation at skyrocketing, uh, inflation rate skyrocketing, Daniela says they can't afford to miss a single day of work. They work six days a week in order to pay the bills and to send money back uh, home to their family. A as a contracted worker, worker, their employers offer no paid sick days under any circumstances, which is fucking psychotic. Uh, more than two and a half years into the pandemic, uh, caring for more for the most vulnerable older people in long term care uh, in the long term care system, many workers like Daniela still can't afford to stay uh, stay home of if they are sick or if their children are sick. Workers' rights organize organizations and ac academics tell CTV News. At the end of 2021, Daniela got COVID-19 and they had to stay home for the 10-day isolation period and they were not uh, paid for any of it. Their employers did not let her know about the province's uh, three-paid sick day program. And by the time they f found out about it, it was too late to apply, they said. Classic employers. It, it's, it, it's just commonplace that that happens. Um, it was really bad. I had to live under my, under my savings, said Daniela. They said if they go to work sick, their residents in long-term care could die due to their fragile condition. Uh, I feel like the government is telling us we are not important for them. They want us to work for Canada no matter how and in what conditions. They are trying to tell us we are some kind of machine, they said. Through the decision, though the decision on sick days has focused on healthcare workers, any enacted legislation it would likely cover uh, workers across multiple sectors. There is no province or territory in Canada that offers 10 paid sick days in a calendar year, despite recommendations from advoca uh, advocacy uh, organizations over the last two years to allow that amount for, of time off. Employers can offer more leave to their employees, but advocates want to ensure all workers are entitled to a minimum of 10 days per year under legislation. Based on current sick day legislation, some jurisdictions are required to uh, requiring businesses to shoulder those costs. For instance, in BC, legislation went into effect uh, at the start of 2022 that mandated all workers in the province be entitled to five paid sick days, uh, pay, uh, paid uh, sick leave if they have been on the job for 90 days or longer. It's the only province that has provided five days permanently to its residents. BC, uh, BC instructs employers that they will need to pay staffers or, or staffer uh, those five days. Uh, other others have yet others have implemented uh, policies that temporarily uh, that are only temporary due to COVID nineteen. 
However, the BC legislation does not cover those uh, excluded by uh, employment standards uh, by its Employment Standards Act. This includes unionized workplaces, independent contractors, and other workers like a, a home care worker who's employed for less than 15 hours per week. Currently, workers in Ontario are entitled to pay, uh, three paid sick days that were implanted in April 2021 during the height of the third wave of COVID-19 after calls from ag ad advocacy groups that said uh, the lack of paid leave was fueling uh, what was one of the most uh, devastating ways of COVID-19 in the province. On December 5th, uh, Ontario, the Ontario Conservative government voted against a bill uh, introduced by the NDP uh, MPP, uh, Jill Andrew, Peggy Sattler, Dolly uh, Begum, and Sarah Singh, titled Stay Home If You Are Sick uh, Act 2022, or Bill Number 4. The legislation... The legislation would have provided 10 paid sick days and 14 uh, days during public health emergencies within a calendar year. In, summer, in the summer, Ontario announced that it would extend the temporary th uh, three-day sick program until March 2023. To pr uh, the program works by allowing employers to be uh, reimbursed by the government up to $200 per day for a maximum of three days for pandemic-related absences, due, including vaccination, uh, isolation, or uh, caring for relatives. In an email sent, in an emailed statement to CTV News, the Ontario Minister Ministry of Labor, uh, imagine uh, immigration and skills. Uh, development said the province's COVID-19 sick days program has supported over uh, 500,000 workers since it was implemented. As the program was extended to March 31st, this will give workers the ability to, quote, take time off when they need it stayed. In Prince Edward Island, the bill introduced by the opposition Green Party that proposed 10, uh, proposed 10 paid, uh, days a year was voted down at the end of November. Currently, the province uh, mandates one paid sick day per, per year to be provided to workers who have been in a job for at least five years. And in Quebec, workers are able to take two paid sick days off uh, a year. That legislation in uh, pri uh, the in place prior to the pandemic. The federal government recently implemented ten paid sick days to leave uh, paid uh, sick day paid sick leave, but only for uh, the one million workers across the country who are employed federally uh, regulated in regulated private sector workplaces. The, uh, the federal government announced in November that the policy was introduced so those workers do not have to choose uh, between their pay and staying home when sick. While legislation would cover all workers, those uh, in precautious jobs, especially con contracted healthcare workers would benefit from legislation, as would the healthcare system overall, experts told CTV News. According to McKenzie, there, uh, there is currently a two-tiered system where some healthcare workers, often in hospitals, are paid better and receive benefits like sick days while others are low pay low wage and work on contract which is true uh, everything about the fucking healthcare system is uh, is two tiered
Um, it makes very little sense to me to be saying that this is the time where we ignore what is a basic uh, public health uh, imperative, if not a human right, he said. There are people we really need to focus on because they are the fundamental building blocks of which the whole healthcare system is based on. Uh, doing face-to-face -face care in the community or long-term care. In October, in uh, Wellesley Institute, uh, the Wellesley Institute published a report titled Thriving at Work, a Health-Based Framework for Decent Work. Uh, the report said that according to workplace safety and uh, Insurance, uh, an insurance board, more than 27,000 Ontario workers had been infected with COVID-19 on the job. Neighborhoods in Toronto had been, or, or that had the highest uh, portion of COVID-19 cases contained the highest amount of essential workers who were more like to be res uh, radicalized and not be able to work from home, it states. Or racialized, sorry. Not radicalized. I mean, who knows, maybe they were radicalized by it. But yeah, like, that's unsurprising. Like, we already know that a lot of these essential workers are, are uh, racial minorities, and a vast majority of the... Uh, the worker or the places that were hit by COVID-19 the worst were were definitely uh, more racialized communities as well. The Institute determined that in order f for workers to thrive, adequate income, benefits, job security, and exclusive work in, or inclusive work environments have a, are critical for an individual's health and well-being. Uh, Maxwell Smith, a bioethics, uh, bioethics uh, and assistant professor in the Facility of Health Sciences at Western University via phone interview told CTV News uh, uh, last month that paid sick leave was or is a strategy that's not only a way to curb infection, but makes good economic sense too. It also reduces uh, anesthesia by preventing outbreaks and the chance of workplace cultures that could become that could come because there's not much infection, not so much infection. He said. Uh, this will protect the health of workers, communities, and it's good for businesses, said Smith. It seems pretty uh, bar door, uh, barn door obvious to me that it's a good that it's good for whichever perspective you want to take, he said. Without prote without protections, it may be difficult to recruit root new healthcare workers into the system amid a pandemic uh, as there's a fear of becoming infected and uh, repeat infections, especially with the threat of long COVID, said Smith. Uh, the incumbent on the government to provide as safe as safe environment as possible for people to do their job to do these jobs he said if ontario experts uh individuals to stay home when they are sick and wear a mask if they are sick at, at home dr uh, kiran moore has recommended th then provincial governments should give workers the tools to be able to stay at home. 
said Smith. In May 2021, the Ontario Science Table released a uh, paper on the benefits of paid sick leave. Uh, its research highlighted the, that in the U.S., introduction of paid sick leave was associated with a 50% reduction in COVID-19 cases per state per day. The paper found that essential workers experienced uh, disproportionate rates of COVID-19 infections. It also indicated that the economic impact of paid sick leave was a factor in economic stability and recovery, though increasing uh, productivity, preventing absences, and stopping workplace closures. And according to a paper, or a 2022 paper from the Decent Work and Health Network, a health and labor rights uh, advocacy group, uh, the lacking of paid leave is, has impacted Ontario's most dis, uh, diverse neighborhoods the most as immigrants and newcomers are more likely to take low-wage, uh, precautious work due to employment barriers. A report released in June from, the Statist from Statistics Canada that surveyed healthcare workers found 86.5%, including doctors, nurses, and professional support workers, are feeling more stressed on the job during the period uh, of September 2021 to November 2021. But nurses were the most likely to report they plan to leave their job or change their job in the next three years, according to the survey. wonder why that is. A 2018 analysis of OECD nations Found that found there will be a shortage of uh, 120,000 nurses in Ontario by 2030, and a 2020 report of the RNAO found a third of nurses that provide uh, direct patient care are approaching retirement. At the end of October, Ontario's nurse, nursing college allowed nurses uh, educated outside of the country to temporarily practice while they while they work towards being a full licensed being fully licensed in Canada to help bring up more nurses into the system. But increase increasing conditions overall. Uh, include leaving uh, leave policies would help as well according to the decent work and health dr uh, Nahid Sasoni a physician and member of the health network told CTV news in a phone interview that he was very disappointed to the Ontario government had voted against the NDP proposed sick day legislation. It would have really helped a lot of people, he said. It would, it will undoubtedly have negative impacts on workers across the province, he said. Dasoni uh, said he and his colleagues who are working on the front lines are very frustrated and upset by the province's inaction on more sick days. Workers need to be able to stay home when they are sick or when their kids are or when their children are sick, he said. Which yeah, he's right. So, yeah, Alberta uh, we've discussed this before. Alberta's health system uh is seeing a significant uh, turnover. Um 
Alberta's health leadership has a significant turnover since Daniel Smith became premier, as firings or resignations have hit uh, the three most senior public health doctors, the province's chief uh, pandemic, and the board of the centralized health authority. Uh, the changes were made after Daniel Smith's successful campaign to lead the United Conservative Party, in which she pro in which she promised to overhaul the structure of Alberta Health Services, which she blamed for mismanaging the COVID nineteen pandemic and promoting the need for business. Resignations and vaccine mandates, which she's which she opposed, which was, yeah, that that's just fucking silly. Sorry. Uh, Daniel Smith has since made health care one of her major priorities as premier, setting in motion a progress that the go that the government says will address waiting times for surgeries, emergency rooms visits and ambulances the opposition the new democratic party and public health expert experts argue the scale of the leadership changes uh could not only affect uh timely public health advice but could also but also could uh, stifle progress or progress at a time when the system is facing serious challenges uh one of smith's first major acts as premier was to fire the 12 person part-time board of uh ahs and replaced with a single administrator john uh howell who is responsible for ensuring in the healthcare reforms the premier argues that that having a single person working full time on the file will allow uh, the more uh, rapid change. I'm not even convinced by that. Uh, that same week, Dina Hinshaw was removed as chief medical officer of health and respected and replaced by Joe. Or Mark uh, Joeff, a senior uh, official with AHS, who was appointed on a temporary basis. Since then, two deputy chief medical uh, officers of health have also resigned. In addition to the top, uh, in, in in addition to the top uh, paramedic. Uh, there is there also remains an interim chief executive officer of AHS after uh, Rina uh, Yui was fired under the direction of former Premier Jason Kenney. Both AHS and the Alberta government maintain that changes in leadership will not detract from work to address the healthcare's uh, the healthcare system's problems, which have been exacerbated by staffing uh, shortfalls, a recent surge in respiratory illnesses, and capacity issues seen across the country. Any suggestion? that recent changes are unprecedented or a threat to the uh, continually or, or contingency of healthcare services is simply wrong. Steve uh, Buick, press secretary of health, uh, press secretary to health minister Jason Hoping said in a statement, yeah, he's fucking coping, all right. Uh, that's that's for sure. 
Um, anyone familiar with leadership are clearly not beyond the normal capability of an organization on that scale to absorb. Mr. Buick's statement thanked the former health leaders to, for their service. AHS spokesperson uh, Carrie Williamson said staff have worked to increase capacity and improve access to patient care through pandemic and that work continues. None of these recent changes have impacted our ability to enhance patient care, he said in a statement. Uh, Gaynor Watson Creed, a public health physician who previously served as Nova Scotia's deputy chief medical officer of health, said sweeping and swift changes made in the absence of clear reasoning points to a system points to a system in crisis uh, there is a loss of confidence there is a loss of faith there is a loss of capacity to get the job done something is happening there ne there and that is not a good signal for public health she said it would it would have had made more sense to avoid a uh, turmoil by working with existing leadership and using their expertise to push forward meaningful change, Dr. Watson Creed said. Dr. Watson Creed. Right now, they've created instability in this in a system that really can't afford it at uh, at a time where predatory uh, disease threats have not gone away the first casualty of miss smith's organizational restructure was dr inshaw who's who served as chief medical officer of health throughout the pandemic under Mr. Kenny. Dr. Hinshaw was repeatedly a target for Ms. Smith's for Ms. Smith during the UCP leadership campaign. It's unsurprising. In November, Dr. Uh, Joff was appointed to the role at, on a temporary bias or basis. He was previously juggling the chief medical officer of health duties and the and that of the um, AHS a vice president and medical director. But is now the top doctor full time, and Ms. Mr. Buick is. Uh, uh, said Mr. Buick. Uh, it's still in term, he added. I don't know how, I, I don't know of a timeline or target date for uh, appointment of a new permanent C, uh, CMOH. Dr. Hinshaw frequently provided public health advice during her tenure through social media or public press conferences. Since his appointment, Dr. Uh, Joeff has provided one written statement on the spread of respiratory illnesses and posted to Twitter last Tuesday after an absence because of uh, unexpected account issues. In the tweet, he recommended that Albertans wash their hands, stay home when sick, and get vaccinated if they choose. Kind of weird how he's not suggesting uh, wearing a mask. Dr. Watson Creed said losing, uh, losing timely advice 
from a trusted voice can be jarring from the public and erodes confidence in the entire system, which is what they're trying to do. You can understand how the public si public health system itself would have trouble rebounding from those changes, and that's before you're talking about what else might be at play that's hampering connections with the public, she said. Last week, Mr. Coping also confirmed that confirmed Alberta's two deputy chief medical officers of health, uh, Rosanna Salvatera and Jing Hu, submitted letters submitted letters of res resignation. He did not provide details of their departure. Uh, the same week, uh, AHS confirmed that Senior Provincial Director of Emergencies Medical Services and Chief uh, Paramedic Darren uh, Sandbeck, who oversees emergency medical services, will leave his role on January 9th, but declined to provide details of his exit. Dr. Hugh and Dr. Sandbeck could not could not be reached by the Global Mail. Uh, Dr. Salvaterra declined an interview requested, but voiced her admiration for Dr. Hinshaw and Dr. Hugh. When her resignation was confirmed, I, I consider myself fortunate to have had the opportunity to work alongside them for the past for these past 14 months she said at AHS uh Maros, uh Chase will continue as interim CEO until a permanent replacement is selected Tony Dagnon, one of the fired uh, AHS board members, previously said that uh, that the board had narrowed down the search for a new CEO to three candidates before they were disbanded. Mr. Williamson, the AHS spokesperson, said that the search will resume in the in the coming months but declined to say whether those candidates are still interested there is also temporary leadership uh taking the place of mr senbeck and mr williamson abby Sariha Ron, Director of Systems Leadership and Innovation at the at the Institute of Health Policy, uh, Management and e Evaluation at the University of Toronto, said changes said change can be beneficial to health organizations, but she said the solution in Alberta is alarming. Doctor. Uh, Sir, uh, Suriharan said people stepping down from their roles after firing points of culture issues or firing points to culture issues within the organization could have a ripple effect. With a lot of interns and transitions, a lot of decisions will get delayed, she said. And this w is going to cause frustration for people already in the system. People will start saying, enough is enough, I need to leave. Uh, Dr. Suriharan said there should be clear reasoning when changes like this take place, which she said haven't been shown in Alberta. 
uh, David Shepard, NDP health critic, said the widespread changes of wide, widespread lieges to leadership only worsen existing problems, such as uh, staff morale. He's, he said Dr. Uh, Cowell had been hailed by Miss Smith as a lone ranger to the rescue, but that real change will require greater cons uh, consultation with frontline workers and with healthcare experts. So we did talk about this already. Um, Trudeau says that the province, uh, Trudeau is giving the provinces what they want, uh, won't improve any, uh, won't improve anything. We did talk about this. He is 100% right about this. I, I don't blame him on, uh, I don't blame him for not wanting to do so without strings attached. We've seen time and time again that when there's no strings attached, they don't actually fucking do anything. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says simply giving into the province's demands on health care funding won't guarantee improvements for Canada's strained health care system. Ottawa and the provinces agree that the country's health care system is facing a crisis, but when health ministers met in Vancouver last month to hammer out the detail to hammer out a deal to improve health care, a disagreement over funding prevented any progress. Provinces have been calling on the federal government to boost their share of health care funding, but Ottawa, won't, but Ottawa insists it won't offer up any cash until the provinces agree to meet a certain condition, such as increasing access to family health services. In a year-end uh, interview with CBC News, uh, Chief, Poli uh, Chief Political Correspondent Rosemary uh, Barton uh, Trudeau stood firm in, on the federal government's uh, position, which he should. I completely agree with him on this, on this issue. If I were to, s to send people all the money that they, they, all the money they need in the provinces, there's no guarantee that folks would be waiting less in hospitals, Trudeau said. There is a, no point putting more money into a broken system. In the full interview, uh, the full interview was aired on CBC uh, TV, television on Sunday at 11.30 a.m. The impasse comes as many health facilities particularly children's hospitals struggle with a shortage of staff and overwhelming demand due to a combination of COVID-19 influenza and respiratory infections. Uh, Quebec Premier Francois Legault said he is more confident after meeting the Premier or, or the Prime Minister Tuesday that the premiers and the federal governments can arrive at a healthcare deal for long-term increased funding. I really, I really sense that I really sense there was a desire to move forward on that issue. Legault said, "I think we're moving in the right direction." Earlier this month, Canada's premiers presented a. Uh, united front and retaliated uh or re reenacted their demands that Trudeau uh sit down with them per personally to hammer out an agreement on the healthcare costs. Premiers also also defended their refusal that they won't their refusal to accept conditions on additional federal funds and pushed back on any suggestions of throwing more of their own money into the pot even though they're even though some provinces are posting budget surpluses some 
something Trudeau also pointed out in the uh, year-end interview. Which, yeah, like, if you have a surplus of cash just sitting around for health care, I can't blame the guy for this, right? If you have, like, a surplus of, like, over, like, a billion dollars that hasn't gone to health care, and the government's being like, hey, you know, we will give you more uh, more money for health care, but you got to make a promise that you're going to be sp actually spending all this money on health care. I, I don't blame them for that, right? Like, am I crazy? Like, no one should no one should be, like, upset with that. Trudeau also said that if he were uh, to offer up the funding without conditions, he'd be suffering his only leverage to, or he'd be surrendering his only leverage to pursue improvements over Canada's healthcare system. One of the only few levers I have is saying, I'm not going to give you the, this money without no conditions. I will fully participate in the funding of it. As long term, as long as those real improvements are made, he said. Which, yeah, I don't disagree with him on this. Like, if you have a surplus in funding, like, it's kind of telling what the fucking, what they fucking want, right? Anyways, let's move on to Maid. Let's move on to the maid stuff. So apparently Aaron O'Toole uh, rejects the proposed expansion to maid. I don't know if I necessarily fucking buy that because it's fucking Aaron O'Toole and he was saying the Nazi parts out loud uh, when he was, you know, running against Justin Trudeau. Like, remember that? Remember how fucking wild it was when he said the Nazi parts out loud? The Department of Veterans Affairs has new protocols in place to ensure no vets looking for mental health support are given advice on medically assisted dying. If a veteran brings it up to a, to a caseworker, the caseworker is instructed to bring it immediately to the supervisor and the supervisor deals with it. It's an issue that's to be dealt with, as I said, between the doctor and the patient, and that's the way it must be. All right, as first reported by Global News, several veterans have come forward over the last month, and they say they received counseling from at least one Veterans Affairs caseworker on medically assisted dying. So what more should the government be doing to support veterans? Aaron O'Toole is a former veteran. There is a lot we can do to assist veterans. Uh, first of all, we can actually fucking uh, provide the services that they were promised for going overseas, risking their lives, and, you know, uh, protecting our and our allies foreign interests within uh, within these countries we can you know it, we, we can fucking uh, improve the quality of life not just for veterans but for every Canadian across the board whether that be uh, universal housing inc actually increasing the 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 or actually like investing more into the healthcare system and not sitting on surplus uh, budgets, um, you know, like uh, making uh, going after these fucking corporations that are uh that have a fuck ton of uh profits and like introducing windfall tax on them to get them to lo and like making them lower their fucking prices instead of uh having t uh engaging in price leadership um you know there there's a there's a bunch we can do to do that but i'm kind of curious to see what this fucking moron has to say let's 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 take a look to see what he has to say veterans affairs minister former leader of the conservative party and he's with me now mr O'Toole, it's good to see you thanks for coming in it's good to be back you you've raised these kinds of issues in the past when when this was first being debated in 2016 about these specific concerns for veterans what do you make of these new protocols that it's got to go to a supervisor right away is that strong enough well no it's not strong enough we should not have medical assistance in dying for someone with a treatable condition and post-traumatic stress injury or operational stress injuries depression many veterans will get this as a result of their service to canada 
And when they're calling an assistance line to get claims or support or to get faster counseling, the last thing the government should ever be doing is recommending assisted dying. They, they need help. And right now, uh, virtually 90% of our complex cases at Veterans Affairs are mental health cases. So this, we said this would be a slippery slope that would be very, very dangerous for people with mental health. It's kind of like we should be investing into mental health services then. And not trying to fucking demonize it like you have. Conditions, not just veterans. So I'm glad there's a pause, David, but this shouldn't be an option for someone we can treat. Well, in, in fairness, m my understanding of this is that this was not something that was being offered by the government intentionally. It appears to have been one rogue employee that they've now referred to the RCMP for criminal investigation. And it seems like the refer to the supervisor is maybe a way to put a bit of some guardrails around it. Is that how you view it? Well, look, it's illegal to even happen now. These, right. these changes are not even supposed to happen until, until March. I've heard the, the number is more like eight cases, and there's multiple case workers. So what I'm hearing from veterans, David, is completely different than what the minister is saying. And, and flagging it for a superior, this is still reinforcing that this is an option. Remember, that veteran, or the eight veterans that called the assistance line, are usually looking for help of some sort. Um, if, if MAID comes up in the conversation, whether it's from the agent or from the veteran, it should be, how can we get you help for this treatable condition. Because, you know, I do a lot of work with Romeo Dallaire. He's been in dark spots, got the help he needed, and now he's helping child soldiers around the world. So these are treatable conditions. This should not be treated like a terminal or, or irremediable uh, physical condition. And th this is a, a, a warning we've had for many years, and it's sad. He's wrong about the, uh, the amount of people that uh, have been recommended to to made he said it was what did he say it was like seven or eight in toronto a fatal attack on a 59 year old man allegedly so by the minister when he was here last week it wasn't uh what he said it was it was uh it was four or five it wasn't uh It wasn't seven or eight that he was uh, saying it was. He's fucking lying. Like he always does. We've seen time and time again that Aaron O'Toole loves fucking lying. So he's not even, he's not even right on that. Like, like yeah, I, I get it. The fucking liberals are dog shit. But like, come on, bro. You don't need to fucking lie about that. Their their scouring of their records has only turned up four uh, vet cases, and that's four too many uh, for Veterans Affairs to be offering this. And it's not on their menu of options. Someone has done this in defiance of, of policy. But it sounds like you're speaking bigger on this than simply the veterans community. Are you saying this shouldn't be offered to anyone with a mental illness, despite the court orders uh, saying that MAID needs to be expanded? Th there was no court order on this, David. In, in fact, well, there was a judgment in Quebec, was there the not? The Quebec court said the original... Uh, legislation from 2016 was a little too restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, she quoted the speeches I gave on the in the House on Veterans in the judgment in Quebec. The government should have appealed this, David. This will eventually go back to the Supreme Court anyway. The fact that, that the Attorney General did not refer a lower court decision in Quebec to the Supreme Court, they intervened here and the Senate intervened. The medical professionals, the veterans community, most mental health professionals, the vast majority, do not want to see this for treatable conditions. You know, Bell, let's talk. All the great work we've, we've done. Yeah, no shit, bro. No one, <laughs> no one wants fucking, uh, no one fucking wants this shit. Like, if you can pr provide, uh, if you can pr fucking provide, um, like, adequate, uh, um if you can provide adequate uh care to those individuals yeah of course people are going to want to do that rather than fucking dying but as as we've seen time and time again and as we've talked about time and time again on this broadcast a vast majority of these people live in fucking 
live in poverty. And they it's hard for them to like you know fucking get by so they rely on like crowdfunding like with that one guy that lives out in Alberta for example or like the egregious fucking uh abil uh the egregious fucking um uh amounts of money that e either seniors or disabled people oftentimes uh, they they tend to be both don't even get like it, it it's like not enough for anyone to live off of so the they're only like the only feasible thing that they actually see that they can do is by like is by fucking dying which is which should not be happening like yeah no shit no one wants that but we have to, we, as provincial and federal leaders, they should be, oh, excuse me, they should 100% be stepping up to the fucking plate and actually doing something about it. Instead of just bitching and moaning about not having enough funds to do, like, anything. Despite the fact that, generally speaking, there tends to be a surplus of funds. Like, it, it's pathetic that that these people have to deal with that there is no reason why uh these people have to suffer because uh because of their provincial government sitting on a surplus amount of money that can easily solve their problems done reducing stigma means we need people to get help not to be calling a government line and being offered end of life care so there's so much we can do here, and I think the slippery slope is already readily apparent when multiple VAC workers are doing it. And let me add one other thing, David. I talked today to Wounded Warriors Canada. They're being overwhelmed with calls from veterans who no longer trust calling the assistance line after having heard what happened. But, okay, you say there are multiple caseworkers. We, we don't have that in the public domain with evidence. We do have one. So you say multiple and as many as eight. We, we have confirmed one and up to four people being... There has been confirmed four and upwards of five. Uh, when was this? Yeah, it, there's there's a, uh, four and upwards to five. So Aaron O'Toole, keep in mind, Aaron O'Toole's fucking lying about this. As uh, like I I showed you guys that there was uh I showed you guys what the number is. I don't know why he's trying to fucking hammer home that it's eight. It's not fucking eight. It's four five at most which yeah don't get me wrong that's still pretty fucking bad that should not be happening at all but ugh, just makes me so fucking mad man they offered this they referred it to the police said it never should have happened and are trying to set up safeguards to make sure it doesn't happen again so I is it really a slippery slope if they're putting that kind of friction on this slope to try to stop it from happening? In the last few months, David, as I've been speaking about this, uh, as you know, I have a little more time to advocate on important issues yeah. like this. Um, I've heard just today from a case of uh, workers' compensation, uh, someone who happened to be a veteran but was calling a workers' compensation line in Alberta being referred. I had a constituent calling about a pension issue being referred by an agent to consider made. You know. Having been Veterans Minister, I know how difficult it can be for an agent to deal with someone who's in mental health stress. They don't even understand what MAID is. Oh. Most of the government themselves don't understand. That's why the court in, in Carter wanted a bright line so that it was someone that was really in a terminal, terminal condition, not someone that can be treated. And that's the difference with mental health. It's going to be impossible to properly manage this in a way that is is fair these cases you're hearing about in other areas i, I mean what are you doing I, I know it's not your responsibility but what are you doing about it in terms of reporting it to the uh, proper authorities reporting it to police i mean uh, obviously <laughs> this should not be happening nothing all about a pension issue so what what action can you or will you take on i honestly think he's lying about that well, like there's no shot that he's not right but like he doesn't like he doesn't fucking care if these people die just for full transparency right he just does not give a shit
Like, it, it's... Ugh, I fucking hate him so much. He's such a fucking liar, dude. Thomas. I, I think the, the very fact that society right now doesn't understand that this is not even allowed now, but the fact that the government's uh, own legislation is going to allow uh, assisted dying where the state actually takes a role. But the thing is, is that we do have made already. It, what? Like, it, that's, that's idiotic. Like, we have legislation for fucking made. And yes, it is a problem that they are going to be expanding it. I 100% agree on that. But saying that, you know, it's illegal for them to do this is just fucking psychotic. Like, I swear to God, whenever fucking conservatives, like, uh, go off on, like, one little fucking thing that uh, the liberals do... It's automatically, oh, it's legal. They can't do that. Like, it's so fucking stupid. What, are, next are you going to say when they uh, review the cannabis bill or the, and, like, the Cannabis Act and shit, like, and uh, look into uh, and, like, redo that legislation? Are you going to say that's fucking illegal next? Like, come on, bro. Like, come on. All in the end of life for someone with a treatable condition? That is the slippery slope. We warned about it in 2016. I, I warned about it in 2020 as the conservative leader. And no, you didn't. People said we were... We you, you literally did not, you fucking liar. We're just trying to stop the legislation. No, people that have a terminal condition that, that are near end of life, that's what really the Carter decision said. It, it said there is a role where the state can, can play a role with proper safeguards and consent. It's completely different when someone has a treatable condition that could be temporary with the proper treatment. What we need to do, David... Yeah, but it also doesn't help that your fucking dumbass premier is also uh, underfund a vast majority of those systems uh, that, you know, uh, make people want to consider made even more, you fucking idiot. God damn. ramp up mental health supports not just for veterans for vulnerable canadians there's higher instances uh for people that are homeless that that would have depression or mental illness indigenous like he honest he probably unironically thinks like remember like the made video with those uh two people like the one in alberta and the one in ontario he probably uh thinks that we're spending too much money on disability benefits Despite the fact that those people are literally fucking, like, just barely scraping by and, like, have to rely on the generosity, in some instance, on the generosity of other people, which barely even makes, uh, which they barely even, like, make, uh, can make rent. Like, it's so fucking stupid. Like, come on, bro. God, I fucking hate conservatives so much. Like, oh my god, they piss me off. Indigenous populations. So in the last election, I had a lot of policies on mental health mm -hmm. uh, and addiction support. That's what we need to be doing. Provide more housing, provide more mental health supports, uh. ramp up health spending, Prime Minister, to make sure we have more supports. Like, keep in mind, like, he's saying all this, but, like, the thing is, is I don't even think he's he ran on any of those fucking policies. Because the funny thing is, and, and like, he tried to show himself as a more progressive conservative and that blew up in his face remember that like because all the fucking progressives saw right through that shit and now the conservatives have just gone mask off with what they're going with what they're going to be fucking doing like clearly like you know playing the fucking card of like oh it's okay we're fucking uh we we want all this shit blew up in their face and now like it's fucking blowing up in uh fucking millhouse's face as well because like he's drastically unpopular across the fucking country and he's like the only places where he's actually fucking popular is like saskatchewan and alberta but like just barely like it's ugh. fucking hate this man fucking hate this 
the provincial level, not open this slippery slope that clearly even the minister himself doesn't understand what's happening. And I'll tell you, I trust the veterans and the veterans organization. I mean, the minister knows exactly what the fuck he's doing. He's not stupid. Like, I don't understand why conservatives automatically think that liberals are all fucking morons. Like, no, they, they know what they're doing uh, for the most part. Like, it, they're not they're not keeping like a, a vast majority of the shit that they're trying to do well hidden that they're trying to hide it like they're not stupid come on like even you don't believe that surely organizations i hear from on this and now that we have veterans not willing to call veterans affairs they're calling charities like right. wounded warriors canada that should be a, a, a red flag. But I want to circle back to this point. If you've heard yourself from two veterans who have been offered this by various people who do not have the authority to do this, because even if it were legal right now, this is something they have to discuss with a doctor, with, you know, with, with a medical practitioner, which I'm assuming is not the person at the other end of a pension helpline call. I mean, are you reporting this to people? Who are you telling about I, this? I'm, I'm talking to, in one case, one of the ministers, um, I've been flagging this on a, on a public basis, as has the Conservative Caucus. I, huh. I don't want to score political points on this. Um, in fact, I've, I've praised the veterans. You 100% you want to gain political points for this because you see how drastically unpopular the Conservative Party uh, is per, uh, nationwide, and you want like some fucking points being like, yeah, no, we actually give a shit about this shit. But realistically, you don't. Like, if, hypothetically, if, like, the, like, come March, when this legislation is, like, inevitably pushed through, and, or is, like, going to be pushed through, like, and, and like, we had a, an election the next, uh, the next fucking, um, little bit, and let's, like, let's say, hypothetically, uh, Pierre Polyev manages to get a majority, he wouldn't fucking do anything about it because he, because like, let's be honest with ourselves, like, n no fucking conservative actually gives a shit about like veterans. Like, it's, it, it is a combination work of conservative policies and liberal policies on why th there are so many fucking homeless veterans that are suffering from mental illness living on the streets and ended up dead. Like, come on. Minister, when there's been times, too, I've, I've criticized him. But the outcry we had years ago about the closure of some offices that weren't being used, we now have Veterans Affairs recommending assisted dying to someone who is calling for inquiring on, on payments or, or assistance. But that is not a it's departmental a, policy. Someone went rogue here. It, it is in multiple departments, and it is happening. What? Because the government even passed these changes through the Senate. This should it, it's it was one person that went fucking rogue you moron not happen you speak to the vast majority of mental health professionals david they don't even know how to define this for somebody what that has a temporary condition that can be treated there is no right that's not even true to end someone's life okay. and just and just as a final point this was supposed to come into force the expansion of this to people with irremedial mental illness mm -hmm. was supposed to come into force in the middle of march they've now they're going to negotiate an extension because the medical profession the psychiatric profession want to make sure there's just clarity on how all of this works to avoid slippery slope and problems i i mean what do you think they need how, how much longer do you think they should delay it and, and what what are the big things you think they need to get done well i'm glad i'm glad minister lametti finally listened if you actually look at most of these made changes they were made well after court imposed timelines they were last minute that's what's happening again here the committee's not even fully completed their examination my personal view, having worked on mental health since I left the military. Uh, Piss off. You have not worked on fucking mental health, you piece of shit. There is no shot that you have. Not one. We cannot do this properly for people that have a treatable mental health condition. Um, and it, it, it will... What? I'm kind of wondering what the fucking comments look like. It's probably just going to be a bunch of conservatives licking this fucking idiot's boot. Right? Yeah, it, it's pretty much a bunch of fucking uh, bootlickers, like, fucking deep-throating his boot. Like, it, oh my fucking Lead god, to man. Errors. I think the 
it's the same reason I'm against. Like the thing is, is I don't necessarily do uh, disagree with the premise. Like I, I, I fully agree that you know mage should not be expanded on. Like it, it should not one hundred percent. But the fact that this piece of shit is going off the rails and saying so much psychotic shit is just ridiculous. Like, come on, bro. Come on. Against the death penalty. One error is too much. And so... Like, honestly... I honestly think that he would probably be perfectly fine with reinstating the fucking death penalty. Right? Like, there's no shot that he doesn't. I think most Canadians are very comfortable with someone with terminal cancer or with ALS or a condition like that um, having dignity and dying that was the origin of the debate going back to sue rodriguez now this is sliding out of control most health professionals are very uncomfortable you have entire hospital uh, psychiatric boards refusing to go forward if this moves so we've got more time but i think this is a chance to to, to look at let's increase housing supports mental health support let's recruit more mental health professionals yeah that's because that's totally something that you guys are advocating for right totally not like uh you're advocating for like building new houses on uh, uh protected land or anything that are like multi-million dollar uh houses that people are not going to be able to afford and uh just a way for your fucking rich business friends to make even more money uh, whilst not solving any of the fucking problems that are actually, uh, that can actually be solved to these people that, you know, need this fucking support or anything. It's totally not like you guys, you know, do that shit, right? Like, come on. To help people not open up this very slippery slope of a, of a made option for mental health. Okay, Aaron O'Toole, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I fucking hate him so much. Oh my God. The federal government is seeking to delay an expansion of its medical assistance in dying law to include those suffering from mental illness as mental health experts continue to raise their concerns. We have heard concerns of Canadians and experts about whether the health care system will be ready to accommodate made requests for persons whose sole medical condition is a mental illness. Today, we are letting Canadians know that our government intends to work with our parliamentary colleagues in the House and Senate to negotiate an extension of the March 17, 2023 eligibility date. The chairs of psychiatric, uh, psychiatry departments excuse me, at Canada's 17 medical schools push for this delay. Valerie Taylor is the psychiatry chair at the University of Calgary and heads the Association of Chairs of Psychiatry in Canada. She joins us in Calgary. Dr. Taylor, good to talk to you again. Uh, w when, la when last we spoke, you were calling for this delay. So I, I wonder, we don't know how long of a delay it's going to be, but what needs to change between now and when the new implementation date is? Well, we simply wanted some opportunities to provide some more feedback and to ensure that all of the policies and procedures are evidence-based and clear. This is going to be a provincial rollout across the country, and so we want to make sure that there's no ambiguity and that we don't get delays after the rollout because people are not sure how to proceed. And so we're really grateful that the concerns were heard and that there is a delay to give us some time to work on that and to work with Health Canada and the people that have done a lot of work up until now. It's not as if nothing has been done, and but I think it's really important to fine tune some of the nuances about this and this gives us a chance to do that. Now, even in announcing this delay yesterday, uh, Minister Lametti did point out that the chair of the government's expert panel, that's Dr. Mona Gupta, told the government the safeguards are in place to meet the March 17th deadline for this expansion. So why do you want the delay when the head of their expert panel thinks they are ready to go? I, I think there's a difference between feeling that the safeguards are in place and really understanding pragmatic on the ground implementation. And that's a voice that we're trying to speak from. Again, respectfully kind of acknowledging that there is a significant amount of work, but there's still 
are some questions and some nuances that we need to get some clarity on. And so we look forward to working with Dr. Gupta and her group to ensure that when this does roll out, that it's gonna be a smooth implementation. Just on timing, do you think the extra time would be a question of weeks? Would it be a question of months? Or, or could it be something that even needs to go beyond uh, this year or beyond 2023? Because there are people who have been- I'm kind of curious to see what the, the fine tuning is uh, going to entail. Because like the thing is, is that uh, it, it, it could go one of two ways, right? It could completely, uh, it, it could like be like only like s for severe instances of mental illness, or it, it could potentially expand things even more. Like there definitely is like concern, uh, for, uh, for sure. But like, I'm just not too sure on like what it's actually going to entail and like, as, as we've seen before, people were fucking furious about this. And I, I honestly think people are still going to be not too impressed with, uh, with this if, if it gets passed. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, if these fucking politicians want to keep their job, uh, you have every single right to uh, call them or, or whatever, being like, hey, if you support this bill i'm not going to be voting for you and yeah just keep in mind that um you know you, you have like some uh, authority when it comes to this advocating for this opportunity who are disappointed in this delay so how can, can you ballpark how much time you think is needed here I don't think it's up to me or my group to comment on exactly that. I know that we want to see it roll out as quickly as possible, as do other people involved in this process. And so, again, without, I mean, it's not up to me, but certainly we would like to see it happen in 2023 for sure. Okay, so when we spoke earlier this month, you raised a, a lack of trained psychiatrists to, to handle a possible influx of cases. And the Minister for Mental Health and Addictions, Carolyn Bennett, said, Canadians should expect instances to be very rare and follow long courses of treatment and assessment processes. I mean, do you, do you, what's your... Uh, like, I think that this should be used as a last resort. Like, uh, I'm sure anyone would agree with that. But the thing is, is if, like, we have more instances, like, with the rogue, um, with the rogue person going off, or the, um, or if we have a lot more, uh, problems, like, with the, uh, the people with disabilities and everything that are, and, and like, mental health uh, issues, you know, dealing, uh, that are, like, in poverty, you know, like, it's, it's definitely something that we need to discuss. We need to have that conversation and we need to actually like fucking look into this. Like it should 100% be used as a last resort. Like if at all. Because we do have like there are methods to uh help people with serious uh uh mental problems and like people who are disabled right but the thing is is we don't want to have the fucking grown-up conversations to actually deal with it it's and it's so fucking frustrating What's your view on that expectation by the minister i i think we don't know what we're going to see but we do know that you know there are some questions around whether or not we need to have a psychiatrist or mental health specialist as a mandatory assessor whether or not that's going to be feasible or if that request is going to cause delays, whether or not a psychiatrist as a consultant uh, is sufficient, whether or not we can have consultants in one province consulting on cases in another if we have some lags. So it's just, you know, there's some fine tuning needed, but it's not as if we're far from the finish line. We just want to make sure that you know, this has been ongoing for two years. We don't want to see a rush due to some arbitrary deadline that will then actually delay implementation because I think if we run into problems quite quickly, 
there are going to be pauses at the provincial level. And so, you know, our goal is actually to ensure that this gets up and running in a way that patients and practitioners are comfortable with sooner rather than later. And so we are really grateful for the opportunity to work with the government, to work with Health Canada, and ensure that the final product is something that is evidence-based and going to be simpler. It's never going to be mm -hmm. simple, but simpler to implement. Right. Uh, you're not stopping, trying to stop it from getting done. You just want to make sure it's done right. I, I understand that position. But you, you have on the other side of it, you have advocates of the expansion who are arguing that barring one group from assisted death is discriminatory and, and, and unconstitutional and, and stigmatizing. So uh, what's your message to people who, while you support this expansion of medical assisted and dying, people who oppose this extension, they want this to come into effect on the original date in March. What's your message to them? I mean, uh, like, I, I think anyone that is, like, fully in support in the expansion of MAID is a complete and utter fucking psychopath who uh, lacks any form of empathy. Like, it's... We have solutions for uh, these people that are going to, uh, unfortunately, be using... Uh, using made right but you know we don't want to fucking do anything about it because it's just easier to uh to fucking kill them like it, it's so fucking frustrating like a vast majority of these people don't want to fucking die they literally don't want to fucking die they want to live their lives but they but unfortunately most like the most pe the most that this is going like this is going to open up the floodgates for a lot of people living in poverty like the fact that you know people are fucking considering this is very fucking sad like no people should not have people should not you know fucking choose the option to die because they're living in poverty we need to be solving the fucking poverty aspect of this like it's mm, like i i do not like this man but i think we want the same thing we want this to be implemented in a way that's going to make this accessible and easy for people involved to understand and so i i think the best way to do that is to make sure we do it right the first time and again, this is not a delay forever. It is just we want to make sure that there is not a start and stop. We want this when it starts to be able to move forward. And so I think we we want the, the same thing. And I understand where they're coming from. And they've been waiting for a long time. And, you know, I received a lot of uh, emails, a lot of conversation, very meaningful conversation. I think we want the same thing. And you know uh, and i think we're going to get there okay so now that you have a little bit more time how will your association be reaching out to the government with advice and, and, and on what exactly needs to be done uh, as they negotiate with the other political parties to get a legislative extension well, we've already engaged at a provincial level many of the different uh, heads of the departments of psychiatry across canada with the local registrars who are going to be tasked with implementing this or helping to implement this on a provincial level. There is a feedback document, and not surprisingly, they're asking for rapid feedback, which is not unreasonable. We are engaged in providing that rapid feedback and setting up a series of meetings to engage with the Health Canada group so that we can share our questions, concerns, and help them come to solutions that everybody finds acceptable. Okay, Dr. Valerie Taylor, thank you for your time. Oh, sorry, what was that last thing you said? I just said as fast as possible. As fast as possible. All right. Well, Dr. Valerie Taylor, thank you for your time. It's good to talk to you. <sighs> I appreciate you making yourself available. This is Dr. Valerie Taylor in Calgary. You heard Justice Minister Lametti there reacting to Alberta's gun announcement today. He was actually announcing that the federal government intends to delay the expansion of MAID, that's medically assisted in dying, medical assistance in dying to people suffering from mental illness. Now, mental health advocates have raised serious concerns over its broad criteria and worry about the feasibility of the expansion set to happen in March. We know we need to get this right in order to protect those who are vulnerable. Today, we are letting Canadians know that our government intends to work with our parliamentary colleagues in the House and Senate to negotiate an extension of the March 17th 
2023 eligibility date. Okay. This will require legislation. All right, Karina, a busy day for the Justice Minister, the Liberal government. Uh, th by the way, the CBC's Karina Roman is here <laughs> to walk me through this. I should <laughs> introduce her. Uh, right, they're going to need support to get this done, right? The House rose yesterday, and it won't be back until the end of January. So the minister says it has to be negotiated. Did he give any sense of the timeline for when they want this passed? Well, I mean, obviously they would like it passed before March 17th, which mm -hmm. is when the deadline, but he wouldn't really go there. He said he doesn't want to negotiate in public, but he does say that in talking to MPs from other parties, he does feel like support is there mm -hmm. uh, for uh, legislation that would expand extend the the deadline um, when asked if there's a chance that the expansion wouldn't go ahead at all um, he said well no that would in uh, require a whole nother set of legislation that would likely fall afoul of the courts now he was also asked you know why the need for the delay he, until recently it seemed pretty set that this was going to happen when it was going to happen uh, and he said well first of all there's concerns about the readiness of the very people they're going to ask to assess people who apply to to do this um, but as well the readiness of the healthcare system considering the impact of the pandemic over the last couple of years he said also there is this joint committee uh, that um, you know won't be reporting back until February parliamentary committee and this will give them more time to consider whatever recommendations they have and finally he said you know really they just want to ensure that there's safe and consistent application of this uh, uh, across the country and that they don't make mistakes. Yeah, we, we had Dr. Valerie Taylor from the University of Calgary on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, outlining these concerns that they're not opposed to it, but we got to be ready uh, before we do this or we could have unintended consequences. So, uh, Karina, we heard from Justice Minister David Lametti, but also uh, Minister for Mental Health, uh, Carolyn Bennett. What else did they have to say today? Well, they did acknowledge the concerns over the very idea of expanding it yeah. to mental illness. I mean, that's still very controversial for some people. Um, so they, you know, answered questions about whether, you know, we should be giving access access to, some people say, an easier access to death than the access to the mental health supports that might take away some of the suffering that people are feeling um, with their mental illness. There's long waits for access to psychiatrists and other mental health professionals. Uh, he was also asked, and the many was, about suicide ideation. And, you know, what about someone who just, just you know, decides this is sort of a, s a substitution for that? I mean, if we actually, like, solved a lot of these issues, we wouldn't have to put up with this, right? And he said that if someone is con contemplating suicide, they need to go get help. MAID is not the solution for them. That's not what it's there for, and that's not what it'll be used for. But they were also very emphatic. This expansion will happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Carolyn Bennett saying there are safeguards in place, the same ones that are in place for people who try and access MAID, you know, with an actual physical ailment or disease. Uh, you know, there's two clinicians who have to assess that we're talking about long-term mental illnesses, not something that's recently diagnosed. It has to be an irremedial uh, condition, one that's causing suffering, and they have to have the capacity to make that decision. Um, so I would say more, more all eyes will be January 30th when the MPs come back. Right. We'll see whether if they take the opportunity to introduce new legislation that day. And if so, we'll get a sense, I suppose, of, of what the extension is that they're looking for in terms of timeline. Yeah, it may even be something we get an update on before Parliament comes back because they'll probably have those meetings before that happens. All right, Karina, thanks for watch, walking us through it. So CBC's Karina Roman. Okay, we're going to turn now to another controversy within the medical assistance and dying law. The government is investigating reports that several veterans were advised to use it. At least a half a dozen veterans now report that they have been advised that medical assistance and dying might be the best solution for them. How many veterans have been given the recommendation that they should go to medical assistance and dying? The number. Four or five. Four or five place number one would be too many and that is why we condemn in the strongest terms anyone who has recommended uh, that to our veterans our veterans uh, lived a life of service and deserve the utmost quality of care from our governments okay so what is the government doing to make sure these reported incidents stop veterans affairs minister lawrence mccauley is with me now minister mccauley thanks for coming in my <coughs> i mean i think the vetting process would uh would help out with that right like uh, the vetting process for uh an institution like this would definitely be uh a welcome addition to it for sure <coughs> <coughs> 
I, I'd like to start with your ongoing investigations into, into veterans being offered medical assistance and dying by uh, an employee of your department. Has, has your investigation yielded any new cases? Where are we on that? No. Well, in fact, as you know, when it started first, we had two, and then we, I, 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 we had the investigation. It went to uh, four, and then we extended the investigation, and in fact, it's now turned over to the RCMP. So that's basically where we are. It's not over. Is it four cases or is it five cases? I've seen different interpretations of where it is. Well, the only thing I can deal with, David, is facts. And for us, we have, we've scanned over hundreds of thousands of files and we have found four cases and one employee involved in the four cases. One, one person, four cases, totally unacceptable, and we have to deal with it. And so what is the status of that employee now who is under investigation here? Well, as you know, it's a HR issue and, of course, uh, she is not, um, this employee is not dealing with veterans at all since I heard it uh, when w she has not dealt with veterans from that time to this. You know, I remember this very issue was raised as a possibility when, when medical assisted in dying was first being debated in 2016. So you say it's not acceptable. W what steps and measures are you going to take to make sure something like this doesn't happen again? Well, of course, along with asking for the deputy to investigate, uh, I also asked him to make sure we had an information program with Veterans Affairs staff. We have. I think uh, all the staff now has been well informed and of course if you cannot control what a veteran will bring up but if a veteran brings up this issue they are they will bring it to the supervisor and it will be dealt with from there okay. we do not never did provide information on maid that's between the doctor and the patient so if i'm understanding it correctly if, if a veteran brings it up you have a protocol now for where that veteran could be referred or how they could handle it or did they, they just go right to the supervisor i mean how is that request dealt with in the moment if the veteran raises it? If a veteran brings it up to, uh, to a caseworker, the caseworker is instructed to bring it immediately to the supervisor and the supervisor deals with it. It's an issue that's to be dealt with, as I said, between the doctor and the patient, and that's the way it must be. We do not and will not provide that uh, serve, uh, information. So what sort of guardrails are in place now to stop another employee from doing this sort of thing? I mean, I know there's only so much control you can have on an individual who decides to violate the rules, but what sort of parameters and guardrails have you put in place? Well, of indicating an information program for our, uh, for our case workers and frontline workers to make sure that they do not discuss this issue at all. It's been now and this day, of course, it's been highlighted so well with the media on that, but we have to make sure that down the line that uh, frontline workers do not discuss this issue because it's not an issue that we provide and will not. And as I said, it goes directly to the supervisor. So I, I appreciate there are HR limitations and you can't talk about this person who is under police investigation, but should not some going forward, can you make this a firing offense that if an employee brings this up, I mean that this is, you're out of here, you, you don't deserve to work for Veterans Affairs Canada if you're going to do this sort of thing? Well, of course, number one, I do not want to affect, to affect the investigation. I was Solicitor General at one time and I understand well, you cannot. Mm -hmm. I understand if you're a cabinet minister, you cannot get involved in investigations and this will be dealt with, but the, the proper protocol has to be followed. Okay, one of the other things you're dealing with in your department is a backlog on disability claims in particular, and you've hired hundreds of temporary employees to help clear this backlog. Where is it as we head into the holiday season? What kind of progress have you made there? Well, I'm pleased you asked that. Of course, it's still not where it should be, but uh, David, it was at 23,000, now it's around 8,600. We've invested about uh, over $340 million in this program to bring uh, uh, staff up to scratch and and obviously we're on track to make sure that we meet the national standard by uh, next summer which is uh, 80 percent of the files dealt with within 16 weeks right so the the numbers you just mentioned the 23,000 number and the 8600 number it was 23,000 outstanding right. cases is down to 8600 outstanding that's right. cases so you've cleared about two-thirds of it. That's taken months and months and months. So there's still a long way to go to get to that national standard you're talking about. The national standard, I can tell you, will be reached by next summer. That was the track that we went on, and that's the track we are, w have and will meet, and it's important that we do. As you know, of course, uh, uh, the new applications for years have uh, increased by about just mm -hmm. about 50%, so people are, are accessing 
are trying to access the funds and should. What we want to make sure is that veterans feel com comfortable coming to Veterans Affairs. It's something they fully deserve, and we want to make sure uh, that veterans receive the remuneration they should. Okay. I mean, it doesn't really solve the issue that, you know, they're still fucking on the streets and shit. So they might turn to made as an option, right? One more topic I want to cover with you, and this is yesterday at House of, House of Commons Committee. They tabled this report calling for an end to what's known as the Gold Diggers Clause, which I'd never heard of really until now, but it's a, a 1901 provision for people at home meant to stop women from marrying dying veterans over 60 to try and get their pensions. 1901 is a long time ago. Veterans are living well past 60. Many of them are marrying well past the age of 60, but their spouses are still getting caught in this. So your party promised to do with away with this clause in 2015. Why hasn't it been done, and will it be done, especially now? I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't do, uh, been done away with yet, right? Now that the committee has made this recommendation. Well, of course, as you're aware, I just received the recommendation from the committee, and I will be studying that recommendation and, and, what, and then make whatever decisions we will on that issue. It's, of course, an overall government issue. Sure, but the committee made a recommendation now at the end of 2022. You you ran for this party in 2015 when it was first promised, so I ran you had some ago, David. sure, but you had some idea in 2015 oh. of what this was about, oh. right? I mean, it's in the plan. It's a promise. So seven years later, I mean, wh where are we? What I can tell you is there has been a study done by the committee, and and I have that just a few days ago, and I will be studying that and. And we will go from there. It does seem like a real anachronism, though. I mean, a lot of veterans get married after 60. A lot of people have second marriages. People in my extended family have done that. It seems, it seems odd in 2022, almost 2023, to have something like this on the books, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's something that uh, a little we're bit. dealing with and we'll continue to deal with. And that's why the study was, was done by the department. Okay, but you're uh, not by the committee. You're not going to give me a clear, firm answer on this today, are you? Well, no. I wouldn't be in a position to do that because you don't ask for a study unless you review the study and make sure that you do. No, but it was a prom it's a seven-year-old election promise. Yeah. I, I just wonder why we're at the point now that the committee's only getting to the study. What's important with government is to make sure, David, that you do everything as, as properly as you can, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Lawrence McCauley, thanks for coming in. Have a happy holidays. Well, right now, medical assistance in dying is reserved for people who are suffering from a physical illness. Ottawa was going to change that in March to also include people suffering solely from mental illness. But now it wants a delay. This is a very complex question. Many are concerned about how this will impact them and their loved ones. The Justice Minister says this will give provinces and medical professionals time to get ready for the change and his government time to set standards. We are committed to ensuring that our laws protect everyone. In 2019, a Quebec court found the law was too restrictive. Some senators also pressured the government to open up access. Now some experts say this delay will only prolong the suffering of those with severe mental illness waiting for that to happen. Their condition is incurable. They are in an advanced state of declining capability. They <sighs> were waiting for March to start a process of a long and arduous process of being assessed. But others are welcoming the move, a chance they say to develop educational tools and guidelines for the healthcare system. For how to safely assess issues of vulnerability, whether how we're distinguishing suicide from uh, a rational desire for MAID, how we're determining what is incurable and irreversible in mental illness. The opposition has its own concerns. The government had plenty of time to introduce legislation this fall. Uh, they didn't do that. And, uh, and what we got from the minister today... My man's a little bit too uh, excited for uh, May to come in. He can't wait to be fucking killing people, man. Uh, was nothing in the way of specifics. Uh, just a vague commitment. Like, it's a little bit sus that he's this excited, man. To negotiate with the upper opposition parties. There is no sense of exactly when the new legislation will be proposed or what kind of deadline extension the government will seek. The minister insisting today he won't negotiate that publicly. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News. All right, so Ottawa is seeking uh, to delay the extension of MAID, as we know. Uh, 
The federal government will ask Parliament to delay the coming extension of assisted dying for medical disorders after many leading uh, psychiatrists and mental health advocates argued that uh, proper safeguards are not yet in place and the health care system is not ready for the controversial change, which is true. At the end of the day, we want to be prudent. We want to move in a step-by-step -step way so we don't make mistakes. Justice Minister David Lametti announced in a press conference Thursday. He said provinces, territories, and healthcare professionals have uh, had made clear that more time was needed. We know we need to get this right in order to protect those who are vulnerable, he said. In the new law, which is currently uh, slated to come out uh, to come into effect on March 17th of next year, would make uh, Canada one of the only few countries in the world that allows uh, uh, that allow assisted dying for, for mental illness. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the other ones are, are um, I think it's, what, France and Switzerland? I know, I know Switzerland is one of them. Delaying the extension will require new legislation to pass through the Parliament, which uh, has now adjourned until the end of January. The government have less than two months to amend the law though uh, although mr lametti said discussions were already underway it was not clear how much extra time of uh, the time the government would ask for but mr lametti stressed that it was only a delay and the government still considered uh, expanding made a priority uh, we plan to take this next step he said we are committed to ensuring that our laws protect everyone while supporting the uh, autonomy and freedom of choice that are central to Canada's made uh, regime when medical assistance and dying became legal in 2016 after a Supreme Court decision. Only patients with terminal illness were eligible. In late 2019, a Quebec judge ruled that this legal uh, restriction is unconstitutional and Parliament amended the made legislation to include adults who uh, didn't have a reasonable, reasonably foreseeable death. The change took effect immediately for Canadians with uh, physical illnesses, but was paused for case by case based solely on mental disorders to give for uh, more time to study the issue. Uh, that two year study period would have officially ended next March. The decision to expand made to uh, to mental Ill uh, mental disorders have has been a devising issue among uh, uh, psychiatrists and the focus of polarizing testimonies that the parliamentary committee studying the issue this year in the past few months uh, psych psychiatric chairs at Canada's medical schools and organizations such as the Ontario's psychiatric Association have uh, called for a delay to allow more time for standards and best practices to be developed as well as more careful review for the existing s science. The made law, for instance, requires that a person must have a an uh, rem irremediable illness to qualify but experts argue that is challenging if not impossible for a psychiatrist to uh, 
reliably predict who will cover uh, for mental illnesses. Researchers have also raised concerns that suicidal patients will be hard to identify among those making a rational request for assisted death. Critics have raised concerns that standards of care have not been completed to guide doctors and hospitals to apply the law consistently. Federally funded physicians train, uh, physician training has not yet finished. The law would also be expanding at a time when the healthcare system has been crippled by the fallout from the pandemic and is overwhelmed with rising patient needs and strapped resources. I'm relieved and grateful that the government will give us the time to do, the, to do this right, Sid uh, said uh, Madeline uh, Lee. Uh, a pharma or a uh, psychiatrist at Princess uh, Margaret Cancer Care in Toronto, and the scientific lead uh, for the government-funded assisted dying uh, oralum for doctors. Dr. Lee said the extension will allow Dr training to be built around the best practice standards still being developed and give health care organizers or organizations more time to put into a clear process for staff dealing with complex made requests this permits a thoughtful consideration of a gap of the gaps in the present legis legislation and the challenges of implementation, said Jack Hagerty, uh, the chair of psychiatric at Northern Ontario School of Medicine University. One issue said that require uh, one issue. One issue he said that requires more discussion is how patients seeking MAID will get access to treatments that might help them, and how issues that uh, such as poverty and housing issues will be a prob uh, will be probably considered in the decision. However, Mona Gupta. Uh, a psychiatrist at the University of Montreal and the chair of the Federal Expert Panel on MAID and Mental Illness argued that the delay was not necessary and that the system would have been prepared in March to handle the new eligibility. She said the decision amounted to a continued violation of the rights of patients rights of a patient population that the courts said have should have access to made if we are going to deprive people of a right then we have the we have to be pretty darn clear of what is going uh what what it is we are going to get done in order to ensure that people can exercise their rights Dr. Gupta said. Otherwise, it can always be argued that we are not in a state of perfect readiness. Uh, Sonu gained uh, the chief of psychiatric at uh, Humd Under River Hospital, who has been an outspoken critic of the maid expansion said that he hopes uh, the delay will allow for more uh, constitutional as well as more uh, as well as a careful consideration for the potential risk to marginalized and vulnerable patients 
this is not something where you jump off the deep end. Uh, without clear evidence-based guidelines, uh, Dr. Gaines said. It would be the height of discrimination to expose people to uh, arbitrary deaths. Mr. Lametti said that while some experts, such as Dr. Gupta, felt that doctors were ready to deal with made cases the men for mental disorders, the government's decision is uh, uh, about to make sure that everybody is ready. As well, he d he said a delay will allow the government time to fully consider the recommendations of recommendations that come from the parliamentary committee which just finished hearing testimony late in November and now is and now is slated to submit a final report in mid February. The premier does not All right, so let's move on to Danielle Smith. Fact or understand treaty rights. This conclusion from indigenous leaders after a Wednesday meeting. The day before, Danielle Smith drew comparisons between her plight for sovereignty and federal legislation that enforced residential schools. They have fought a battle what? over the last number of years to get sovereignty respected and to, and to extract themselves from the Paternalistic Indian Act. We get treated the exact same way from Ottawa. Treaty 6 Grand Chief Tony what? Alexis rejected the parallels from Smith. In a statement, he says, I want Premier Smith to focus on our concerns about the Sovereignty Act rather than try to use our people in her fight against Ottawa. A day later, the NDP called on Smith to apologize. If my comments were misconstrued, I absolutely apologize. I mean, she's just doing what fucking conservatives do always, using uh, one group as a political tool. We've seen the exact same fucking thing happen in Ontario with uh, the with the QP strikes. They use the fucking children as a, a political pawn. Instead of, you know, actually dealing with it. And, you know, uh, actually coming to a fucking resolution. Later, in a year-end interview, she said she still sees Ottawa as a common problem. So I'm going to, to make sure that I respect First Nations jurisdiction to, to keep uh, on doing what they're doing. And we're just going to yeah, make sure that right, we okay. get Ottawa to respect our autonomy as well. Political scientist Matthew Wildcat says Smith made an offensive comparison. The Indian Act um, caused fundamental human rights violations. That True. Isn't anywhere close. He he is one hundred percent right about that. The uh, in the Indian Act one hundred percent did cause a bunch of human rights violations. One hundred percent. To the type of conflicts that exist between Alberta and Canada. Treaty Six chiefs noted their Wednesday meeting does not count as appropriate consultation in regards to the Sovereignty Act. That same day, the Indigenous Relations Minister told reporters he feels consultations are going well. I can't help the statement, but the, the engagement was really good. The NDP's Indigenous Relations critic says the UCP government isn't listening. They're failing to grasp what it is that's being said to them. Treaty Six chiefs labeled the Sovereignty Act dangerous legislation and say the Premier will not dictate how they are consulted. Wildcat says it's time for Smith to get a better understanding of what Indigenous leaders are asking for. What's clear is that Danielle Smith and her close team have zero inkling of what's going on with Indigenous politics. Morgan Black. I mean, I honestly don't think that she has, like, any fucking inkling of what's going on in general. Like, she has no fucking clue what's going on, brother. Hello, and thank you for joining us. It is a controversial comparison, and some Indigenous leaders can't believe Premier Daniel Smith uttered the words. Smith I can. Alberta's relationship with I can. She has done, she has, like, misspoken so fucking much. Like, it's not even, like, surprising that she would have fucking done this. Like, let's be, let's be honest with ourselves, right? Federal government to that of First Nations under the Indian Act. And as Tim Brooke reports, Smith isn't the only UCP member accused of being racially insensitive. Danielle Smith's defense of the Sovereignty Act has been lengthy and passionate. 
To some, her latest comments went too far. And the way I've described it to the chiefs that I've spoken with is that they have fought a battle over the last number of years to get sovereignty respected and to, and to extract themselves from the paternalistic Indian Act. Uh -huh. We get treated the exact same way from Ottawa. Speaking in the legislature Tuesday, Smith compared Ottawa's treatment of Alberta to decades of colonialism. I can't quite think of more disgusting comments to make. Some believe it's a dangerous downplaying of Canadian atrocities. I'm not sure how she sees uh, the way Alberta fits into the federal scheme of this country as being the same as children that were kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Just hours after Smith's comments, the Minister of Advanced Education tweeted a video about Alberta's fight against Ottawa, referencing former MLA Alwyn Bramley Moore. In 1911, he wrote a book entitled Canada and Her Colonies. That book includes overtly racist lines like the admission of colored people, yellow or black, constitutes a possible menace to the supremacy of the white race. Another piece on black Albertans says that such an immigration is particularly undesirable. There are um, some very big blind spots uh, within the UCP and this is a clear example of it. On Wednesday, the Premier responded to the backlash. That was certainly not the intention of my comments. And if it was <laughs> taken that way... Sure, I, sure it wasn't. Sure, I, I believe you. Don't worry, I totally believe you. It's totally not like, you know, you, you backpedal a lot on uh, uh, a lot of your comments or anything. Absolutely apologize for that. Dimitri Nikolaitis told CTV News he doesn't endorse the book's unacceptable social views. Indigenous activists say they deserve a better apology. You know, there's no they way that do. you can quote pieces of that text and say that we should be following anything or taking any examples from it other than it's horribly racist and hateful. Tim joins us now with more. Tim, Treaty 6 Chiefs did meet with the Premier this week about the Sovereignty Act. Well, and after that meeting, Tara, they too had some pretty harsh words for Danielle Smith. Now, not only once again are these Chiefs calling on the Premier to completely nix her Sovereignty Act, well, now they're actually accusing Smith of not understanding or respecting Indigenous rights, period. Now, I chatted. I mean, she doesn't really care, though. The Alexis Nakota Sioux Nation. He told me he thinks it's time that the Premier start focusing on actual concerns that these chiefs have instead of using Indigenous peoples in her fight against Ottawa. Tara? Okay, Tim Brooke reporting. Tim, thank you. And good evening. The UCP government is being sued over its Sovereignty Act. A first name. Oh, wait, are they? That's really fucking funny. Oh, that that is hilarious, man. Nation on the Alberta Saskatchewan border fears the province will use the bill to encroach on its treaty rights. Matt Woodman joining us live now. And Matt, is what is what is uh, Onion Lake Cree Nation seeking here? Aaron, it wants a declaration. The Sovereignty Act unjustifiably infringes on treaty rights, and it's seeking temporary and permanent injunctions declaring the act inoperative against its people. Onion Lake Cree Nation filed a statement of claim today against Bill 1. Chief Henry Lewis says his community wants to send a message to the Premier and province that the Sovereignty Act infringes on treaty rights. He's worried the province has granted itself too much power and can now encroach on First Nations traditional territories and natural resources. We remind Premier Smith that no province has the authority to unilaterally change our treaty relationship, which Bill 1 is attempting to do by ignoring our sovereign jurisdiction and treaty relationship. There's no evidence within the legislative debates or elsewhere of consultation with any of Onion Lake's leadership or any of its people. Chief Lewis says the First Nation sent a letter to Premier Smith's office in early December highlighting its issues with the act and asking to meet, but did not receive a response. We reached out to the Premier's office today and Aaron received a statement that reads, quote, we don't comment on ongoing litigation. The Alberta sovereignty within a United Canada Act is constitutional and does not interfere or undermine Indigenous and... Yeah, rights. sure it does. All right. Um, so yeah... Alberta, uh, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith and her policies are not viewed favorably by most Albertans, new polls show. 
Uh, a new poll suggests that Alberta Premier Daniel Smith and her policies are not viewed favorably by the majority of Albertans. The poll uh, conducted by Abaca, uh, Abacus Data from December 6th to 10th says that only a quarter of Albertans surveyed think that uh, think the province is heading in the right direction. A slight majority, uh, uh, 54% uh, said the province uh, is off its uh, is off on the wrong track. Perhaps the imp perhaps most importantly, the 2019 UCP voters think the province is off on the wrong track. Then it's head of the then in the head of the right direction. Uh, David Quetel, uh CEO of uh, Abba Cox uh, Data. Cleto called the group uh, uh, reluctant UCP voters. Abba Cox asked Albertans about four of Daniel Smith's core principles: the Sovereignty Act within a United Canada, or the Sovereignty with in the United uh, Canada Act, uh, an Alberta police force. Pr uh, private delivery in Alberta's healthcare system and uh, sh stopping school boards from bringing in uh, mask mandates. Each, uh, each of those ideas were unsupported by about 70% of those surveyed, which is not surprising. Literally everything that she's done has been drastically unpopular. Uh, Alberta NDP leader Rachel Notley uh, is viewed more favorably than Smith, according to the poll. Within 43% of Albertans surveyed, uh, view notably positively less than a third of Smith's views are positive, which is not surprising. Uh, the survey also got Albertans to rate the leaders on a number of attributes like intelligence, uh, compassion, leadership, and being in politics for the right reasons. Notley had a big lead in all categories uh, except for standing up for Albertans, where she uh, only had a two-point lead. The poll gives the NDP a eight-point lead over the UCP uh, decided voter support. Uh, however, a notable uh, segment for voters who are undecided, 25%, uh, um, that's driven by those reluctant UCP voters who can't quite stomach Smith, uh, according to Mount Royal University political science professor, uh, Duan Brett. They're very unhappy with Smith, but they can't quite get themselves to vote for the NDP. And I also, and I also think that explains why they are undecided it, or why the undecided is so big so they so will they say as bad as smith is is she better than notley brat wondered if the reluctant ucp voters would go for a safer pick or just not vote at all a negative perception so early in the premiership bill's troubles uh, spells troubles for Smith as most new leaders start with a start at a high point and drop off over time. Brad explained. Smith did not start uh, at a high point. First impressions last. Uh, it's not going to be uh, tough for her to change. It's going to be tough for her to change the impression uh, to change the impressions of her. Said Brent. A negative perception so early in the premiership. Uh, oh, wait, I just read that. <laughs> Idiot himbo brain. Uh, the reluctant UCP voters are more uh, contracted in Calgary, the poll found. Cleto uh, said they make up about 15% of voters in the city. I mean, okay, that doesn't really matter. They're either not going to vote or they'll fucking split the votes between the UCP and the 
and notely like it, it it definitely depends uh we've known for a while that calgary is a battleground uh coletto has clearly car uh, carved out the uh the that there's a large segment of people who vote voted UCP in 2019 in Calgary and aren't going to do that this time, said Brett. The poll suggests issues that are top of the mind of Albertans right now are the cost of living, healthcare, and the economy, which, you know, is rightfully on top. Uh, the two things that Smith has put the most uh, energy in since because she became prime minister or became premier is about covid and about the sovereignty act both of those are low uh assailants issues for albertans brett said the poll suggests uh smith's focus on fighting ottawa may be aligned uh uh, uh aligning uh loyal conservatives in the province which, I mean, it doesn't fucking matter. They're going to be voting UCP anyways. Uh, across all voters, mo uh, almost three quarters of... Uh, almost three quarters want the government to focus on the basics like healthcare, the economy, education, and improving roads. Among current UCP voters, those uh, views are split about 50-50. Uh, Coletto said this divide underscores the challenge Smith is facing. Uh, her govern her government's initial focus on the sovereignty act and picking fights with Ottawa may find favor with large parts of her national party base, but it may be off-putting to those needs to convince to vote UCP again," said Coletto. Coletto said that uh, the group will decide the next election are the reluctant UCP voters. The UCP and Daniel Smith think they will win simply by motivating their core base to vote with policy, uh, policy ideas that uh, repel far from voter, uh, far more voters than they attract. Alberta may wake up uh, the day after the election to uh, with another NDP government said Coletto. The survey was conducted with 1,000 uh, Alberta adults from December 6th to the 10th. A random sample of participants were invited to uh, complete the survey. The margin for error for the comparable probability-based random sample of same size is plus or minus 3.1%. Uh, 19 times out of 20. Um, so yeah, Western premiers could be vital for, or could be virtue signaling their uh, way to a democratic crisis. Some of our, some observers observers uh, were uh, revealed. While others were disappointed, uh, as Alberta's uh, lieutenant governor uh, gave royal assent to Alberta's sovereign Alberta's sovereignty within the United Canada Act last week, since the government has yet to invoke the act and the courts have yet to weigh in on its constitutionality, we've reached uh, what we might think of the mid-season finale of the Sovereignty Act saga. It is a good time to stop and reflect on how we got here and what it means for democracy and the rule of law in Canada. Uh, the case for why the Sovereignty Act is unconstitutional and undemocratic has now been widely made, but in short, it shouldn't be and isn't according to any reasonable reading of our constitutional framework up to politicians to judge the outcome of jurisdictional disputes or ignore the rule of law. 
By passing this law, the Alberta government site, uh, sets itself up to as the judge, jury, and executioner of federalism, uh, a federal or, or a fundamental threat to how democracy works in Canada. So how did we get here? We've talked about how we got here plenty of times and whatnot. Uh, in September of 2021, then Alberta Premier uh, Jason Kenney was in trouble after the Premier narrowly dodged a non-confidence motion from within his own caucus. His MLAs were uh, appointed, uh, asked what will actually happen if they get him to resign. Apparently, nobody had a good answer to that one. Uh, their bluff had to be called, and since Kennedy uh, had agreed to the leadership review that would ultimately be his downfall, uh, this brief scene of uh, this brief scene, uh, th th sorry, this brief sense of place integri integrity integru was uh, quickly forgotten. Alberta. About a week later, a group of uh, uh, Fremont conservatives released what they call the Free Alberta Strategy, a series of proposals that would see the creation of an Alberta Provincial Police Force, uh, an Alberta Provincial Pension Plan, the end of the Equalization, and crucially, the Alberta Sovereignty Act that would let Alberta refuse to enforce federal uh, legislation or judicial juris, uh, decisions that ran contrary to the interest of Alberta's people. The timing was uh, probably not a coincidence. From the strategy perspective, the authors may have sensed the Premier was uh, vulnerable from his right flank after he, his handling with the COVID-19 pandemic, and so they had an opportunity to strike. However, it seems pretty clear that the authors did not expect Kennedy uh, to adopt the strategy wholesale, since uh, he later called the ideas behind it uh, catastrophically stupid and a full frontal attack on the rule of law that would turn Alberta into a banana republic. They likely expected someone to call their bluff too, and if that meant only a few, only a few of less uh, radical proposals would be considered, that would be the win. That would still win. Indeed, Kennedy, or indeed, Kennedy. Uh, was already enthusiastic about uh, a provincial police force, for example, and was happy to continue talking about that. It's easy to make uh, outlandish uh, suggestions when you know someone is going to stand up for you. In fact, doing so could help to eventually move the overtune window, uh, the range of politically acceptable policies, positions and serve as a virtual signal to someone's own in-group. The point of the letter is to accumulate what social, uh, social psychologists refer to as uh, insta-group uh, prejudice, an increase in social status associated with uh, skill and respect. In this case, the most uh, extreme proposals uh, signal an ideological uh, commitment to the uh, to a West free from federal uh, instruction. Uh, however, unworkable to uh, unworkable the proposal them, uh, themselves are. Take Saskatchewan's proposal uh, own proposal as another example. Uh, government ministers in that province have taken have taken pains to emphasize their own Saskatchewan First Act as it is more of is more than symbolic. 
even as legal experts argued it wouldn't or uh, uh, it wouldn't meaningfully change any of the province's jurisdictional capabilities. Indeed, they were uh, defending against uh, the exact charges of virtual signaling uh, from the provincial NDP with regard to their own proposal to create a Saskatchewan uh, revenue agency. Both the UCP and uh, the Saskatchewan party appearing to be tough on federal government is the political equivalent to amplify a tried and true message that even their political opponents have leveraged from time to time. Virtual signaling is like this f is fine when the stakes are low, saying over drinks with friends. However, the consequences are necessarily greater when these signals concern uh, public policy. Even if such proposals go nowhere, previously ridiculous uh, positions may be considered more uh, sensible. They also pave the way to for future bargaining positions um, that are even more extreme. Which, yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, look at America. America is an excellent example of this. Uh, this is no longer clear whether El the Alberta Sovereignty Act is a virtual signal uh, that has now gone horribly wrong, or whether Premier Daniel Smith really and truly believes it when she says Ottawa is not a national government. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she uh, actually believes that shit. Uh, the way our country works is that we are a, fed a federation of sovereign independent jurisdictions. They are one of those uh, signatories to the Constitution and the rest of us. As signatories to the Constitution, we have a right to exercise our sovereign powers in our own areas of jurisdiction. To be clear, the that is absolutely not how the country works, which Smith knows at least to some extent last Friday uh, when she joined the premiers and asking Ottawa for more money. Our democratic system requires everyone to agree on a common set of rules that abide by and to abide by them. Um, instead, the premier is playing a game of political chicken by setting up for a constitutional crisis. Uh, indeed, that, that was the strategy's whole point. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we're close. So what's next? Uh, the lieutenant governor was right to give royal uh, assent to Alberta's Sovereignty Act as withholding it would have triggered a very constitutional crisis with uh, Smith's that Smith appears to want the federal government's disallowance pow uh, power would have the same effect and so would not be used ultimately it would it will be and it will be up in the uh, to the courts to, to decide whether the act will st stand or not in the meantime however Albertans have the opinion or the option to let their uh, MLAs know that they do not support the act being used to uh, to ignore the rule of law. After all, oh, most of them do not want to live in a banana republic. All right, let's move on to the um, the shooting that happened in in Van Ha. In Toronto, a fatal Van attack on a 59-year-old man, allegedly by eight teenage girls, is sending shock waves through the city and beyond. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick has the latest from Toronto Police Headquarters. 
Well, police say this started unfolding at some point from 10 p.m. onward, uh, and that there may have been a couple of altercations and incidents involving this group of girls. There was this stabbing that happened right at the intersection of York and University. For anyone that's ever gone through Union Station in downtown Toronto, that's around where it happened. Uh, the stabbing happening just after midnight, police say. A 59-year-old man uh, was the victim of stab wounds. He was brought to hospital and died of his injuries. Police are saying the suspects, as you mentioned, all eight teenage girls, three of them age 13, three of them age 14, two of them age 16. And police uh, apprehended these suspects, they say, uh, soon after the incident. They all made a brief court appearance on Sunday, and all eight of them have been charged with second-degree murder. Now, in terms of what we know about the victim, police do know his identity, uh, but they are not releasing his name publicly, Arthi. Um, they say they are still no notifying the man's next of kin. I just spoke with a detective working on the case. He says the victim has elderly parents. They don't want them to find out about uh, the death of their son through the media, and they are attempting to contact uh, those family members still. Uh, but the uh, Toronto police are making an appeal to the public for their help with this case, saying they believe there may have been interactions with, with other victims, possibly, other people in Toronto in the area that evening with the group of girls. So they're asking people to come forward if they think they may have seen them or interacted with these suspects. Here's more from the detective. If they had any contact with these eight individuals themselves, perhaps they were victimized or they observed behavior that caused them some concern, we would really like to hear from them because we're really trying to track the whereabouts of these eight individuals when we first know that they were there, which is at 10.30 around Saturday, but we may be mistaken. They may have been down there earlier. He also said they believe, perhaps, uh, that the girls met through social media, um, and they are, are following that as a possibility, Arthi, because they don't believe there are any other sort of um, uh, connections between the girls. They say that these suspects lived in different parts of the city, so they uh, didn't have any other uh, known connections at this point, the detective is saying. So they are, are pursuing the theory that these girls may have connected with each other through social media, but that is all part of the investigation. I mean, like, yeah, it very well could have been, for sure. Like, Social media, like, people have organized shit on social media all the goddamn time, regardless of uh, which political lines you fall on. Uh, detectives saying yesterday as well that they did seize a number of weapons from these suspects. Like, a big, a big place for, like, where this shit happens is, like, Twitter, uh, True Social, and Facebook. Again, these... Eight accused teenage girls remain in custody, and another court hearing is scheduled for next week. Now, Megan, this has shocked many people in this city. What sort of reactions are you hearing? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, and we have heard reaction from Toronto's mayor, John Tory, who put out a statement yesterday saying he's deeply disturbed by this story, also expressing his condolences to the victim. Uh, police, by the way, saying that uh, the individual who, who was killed recently had started using Toronto's shelter system. Um, they believe he was a resident of Toronto, but just this past fall had started staying in some of the city's shelters. We are hearing reaction from people who work in, in uh, shelters and for organizations that help people experiencing homeless. Here's what the homelessness, here's what the uh, director of the Fred Victor Center told CBC. Doesn't ha often happen in our, um, in our country and it's something that uh, it becomes shocking. Sadly, assault and violence against homeless people is, is, is a daily occurrence. But that level She's of right. violence is something new and, and, and concerning. And I think the detective I just spoke to saying this should shock people, that this is a shocking and surprising story. Uh, not surprising that a lot of people in Toronto are talking about this today. That is the CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick in Toronto. The estranged daughters of the Vaughn gunman have released a statement shedding some more light on their father. Let's bring in Christina Tenalia for more. Christina. Yeah, the three daughters describe themselves as being heartbroken, acknowledging they haven't chatted with their father in more than five years. We received this statement from the province's Special Investigations Unit. 
I want to share it with you in full. Here's what it reads. Words cannot begin to express how deeply heartbroken we are for the families affected by this horrific tragedy. We offer our heartfelt condolences. We are in absolute shock and utter devastation at the events that have transpired. Francesco Vili was a controlling and abusive husband and father. He has a history of domestic abuse with both the mothers of his children and his daughters. He had aggressive behavior and a Jekyll and Hyde type personality. His children tried to have some form of a relationship but through the years and many offers of help were continuously denied, leaving them no choice but to cut off ties with him for their own health and well-being. His children have been estranged from him for over five years. We are grieving for the families and they... Like, yeah, it, it's sad that this happens. There, I'm sure there's like the personal reasons of why uh, his daughter's uh haven't spoke to him they are in our hearts george Edens was saying this is the only sta statement uh, uh statement that our family will make francesco Villa oh no come on bro why did you have to no fedora come on bro see his photo there 73 years old police say he shot six people in his condo building five of them were killed three of them were members of the condo board in what was years of ongoing disputes and litigation <sighs> that Billy had pursued against condo board members uh, and they had returned uh, in terms of defending themselves as a board uh, seeking to have him uh, essentially well, at the end of this, evicted uh, for being someone that was uh, considered to be a, a troublesome homeowner there in, in their condo unit at Jane and Rutherford. Uh, police have not elaborated here on a motive, but in his Facebook post, his Facebook has since been deactivated. Vili posts videos, his last one almost 17 minutes long, where he speaks out against uh, what he calls to be criminals and uses expletives. It appears quite what? this is directed at condo board members. He also calls out the, the builders and the developers of his building at Jane and Rutherford. In one piece of litigation, uh, one claim from this past summer, he was seeking to sue members of the condo board who were sitting on the board in 2020 for some $7 million, essentially saying they had engaged in a number of crimes. In August, the judge tossed out that, that lawsuit, saying it was frivolous and vexatious. Back to you. Of course he was a homeowner, man, come on. After the tragedy comes grief. With five neighbors killed at this suburban condo tower near Toronto, seemingly because of where they live, Marilyn Iafredi came to honor her friend, Rita Camilleri. She was so good at what she did, and it was always putting the residents of her building first. At 57, Camilleri was the youngest among the five victims killed and now all identified by police. Her partner, Vittorio Panza, was the grandfather of Toronto Maple Leafs defenseman, Victor Mete. Our hearts go out to the victims' families. The team held a moment of silence before their game. Police say the attacks killed three of the condo's directors, leaving only two surviving board members, including Tony Catrone. It's just hard to hear the words that they were, they were killed, you know. For, for, a, for a volunteer physician, you know, trying to, to make the, the building a better place, an officer fatally shot the suspect, Francesco Villi, who held a long-standing grudge against the condo board. Investigators say he carried a handgun and opened fire in three separate units, also killing Naveed Dada, another board member described by family in Pakistan as a perfect gentleman. The chief of York Regional Police said this of victims Russell and Lorraine Manoff. They were devoted to each other and their family. Soulmates in life, and now in heaven. At 66, Doreen Danino was the only victim to survive the attack. Our life has changed. We will never have any sense of normality. Where we go, where we walk, how we live, our home has been taken from us. His wife remains in this hospital in serious condition, while two ongoing investigations seek to answer... I hope his wife makes it through. Key questions, like how the man police say was behind this mass shooting, got his gun, and what ultimately drove him to use it. 
He probably got it from America, let's be honest. There's no shot that he didn't. My wife uh, is in the trauma unit here. Uh, she's in serious but stable condition. Um, she was a victim of the shooting at the condo. Um, I want to express my condolences to the five people who lost their lives. Not only were they residents, they were my friends, every one of them. They, some of them served on the board with me at the condo. And I want to say, you know, we do this thing for our community. We're volunteers. It's about the house we live in. It's about our home. This senseless tragedy could have been avoided. Today, I stand here today with five of my, my neighbors, five of my friends who lost their lives. And I'm dealing with my wife, um, who's sitting, uh, fighting to try to make a full recovery. I want, to, I want everybody to know that it's not just about me and my wife, but it's about my wife's children, our grandkids, all of our extended family, whose lives are going to be affected forever and a day. This is never going to change. Our life has changed. We will never be, we will never have any sense of normality. Where we go, where we walk, how we live, our home has been taken from us. You know, I've been hearing about the assailant over and over. And I know that the media needs to make that story. But we need to talk about the victims. We need to talk about gun control. We need to talk about mental health True. in our society. I'm not saying those, those are contributing factors. But those are discussions that we need to be having. You know, uh, not only as a condo president, but as a national leader, we see assaults in our workplaces. We deal with these things. But we need to have a bigger discussion because it's hit home. We try to have those discussions. But I want to advocate. I'm going to say that I'm going to be on the front and center advocating for gun control. I'm going to be in the front and center advocating for mental health and for victims. Our family has been put into shambles over a senseless act of violence that could have been avoided. We have been dealing with this on the board for four years. Things could have changed. It didn't have to get to this point. We need to move on. Please keep our family in all of your thoughts and prayers like every victim of violence. Please keep my community, our condo, the family of those victims, of the deceased, please keep them in your minds. And, you know, I plead to the media, let's make this front and center about how victims are impacted. That's the story that I'm here to say today. And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, in terms of the criminal investigation, it's an ongoing investigation. I'm not going to comment on it. Let the police determine what the outcome of that investigation is and we'll deal with the, the fallout of what that looks like. My wife was an innocent bystander. She was targeted by an assailant. She's my life, she's my world, her grandkids, her kids. It's a mother, it's a friend. Her life has changed forever. We cannot undo that here today. But what we can do is make change in our communities on how we prevent this from ever happening again. And that's why I'm here. She's the love of my life. She's my everything. And we're struggling to make her as comfortable as possible. And, and we hope that she makes a full recovery. But recoveries are not just about the superficial injury. They're about the mental health component the PTSD that we're going to have to deal with, and whether we're able to walk into our home ever again, that's what it's about. I have not been in touch with the other, uh, the other uh, victims' families. Um, my focus is here with my wife. I know the media wanted to know what was going on. I thought um, we should at least have this preliminary discussion. In the days to come, we will make more formal statements from the Condo Corporation. Uh, and from uh, the families as th this unfolds and more information becomes available. I was with my wife, yes. Is there a I, I don't want to get into it. 
Um, I was with my wife at the time of the shooting. I don't blame him for not wanting to get into it. Okay. We're very optimistic for a full recovery, um, but you know, this is medical. We don't know how things are going to change and unfold. Um, she's in really good hands in this trauma center, and you know, we anticipate and expect a full recovery. Well, what does that mean? A full recovery, her heels, her superficial heels get better, the scar tissue doesn't show. What about here? What about here? That's what I'm worried about. I don't know what that full recovery means, my friend. Um, you know, these victims have families that are, are suffering right now. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, it's a tough time of year for, any, for this to happen to anyone, it, it, it's, it's tough. At this time of year, people are grieving uh, and it's really important um, for not only us as an organization, but for the community to wrap their arms around these families and help them uh, through this very difficult time. The families um, have shared some information with me that I want to share with you because, you know, when we talk about victims from time to time, we seem to re refer to them like they're a number. These are human beings. These are people who had grandchildren. These are people who have loved ones and who were actually killed with their loved ones, their partners. And it's unfortunate um, that we have to report in this way, but it's also important that you understand some information about who these people were and what they meant to their families. So um, I also want to comment on the fact that, you know, our community is grieving. We've had m a lot of outreach from, from community members, and you've seen it yourselves on social media. Um, it's been reported everywhere. There's a lot of people that have been, been impacted by this. So also important for us to, uh, to thank our community for being patient, for thanking them for having the families in their thoughts, and before I share the information, I want to urge those who know these families to do their part and reach out and they can wrap their arms around them too and do whatever they can to help them move forward. It's going to take them days, months and years to get past this and find some solace in, in what happened here. So we'll, we'll do our part and, and uh, do the very best we can to support them as well. So I'm going to read the names and I'm going to tell you some, some personal details about each. And, um, and this information, it's important to know, is being shared on behalf of their families. Uh, we've reached out to them and made sure that they are okay with us sharing these details. Rita Camilleri was a smart businesswoman who had a contagious laugh and a zest for life. She was a loving daughter, sister, partner, and the most caring aunt. She loved to travel, cook, and host for her family and friends who she cared for deeply. Vittorio Panza was a very proud Italian immigrant who was well respected, a well-respected realtor for over 40 years and had a great passion for music. He was a husband, a father to three daughters, and a proud nono to seven grandchildren. He was kind-hearted and a gentle individual who loved his family, friends, and foremost, his entire family. Russell Manock was the most hardworking, caring, loving father and grandfather who cherished every moment he spent with his family. Trusted and loved by everyone who knew him, he was their family rock. We initially released the name Helen, but we've learned from the family that she uses the name Lorraine. Lorraine Manock was the most loving mother, grandmother, and sister. Selfless, generous, a kind soul, and touched every person's lives that she ever met. They were devoted to each other and their family. Soulmates in life and now in heaven. The family are devastated by this unspeakable, tragic loss. I mean, who wouldn't be? Naveed Dada was a great son and a brother. He spent half his life in Canada, and Naveed always wanted to serve his community and help those in need. So 
I just wanted to make today about the families um, and make sure we as an organization were able to come back to the media, to, to the community, and talk about who these people were and what they meant to their families. So thank you. Uh, I'll take any questions you have. Yeah, well, we first, rep uh, we initially released her name as Helen, but we've learned from the family she goes by Lorraine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can't share any details on the investigation as to how that piece happened. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we, we are still pretty early in that portion of the investigation, um, and I really want to keep today about the victims. I mean, updates will come out uh, about it for sure. If it was released today. Uh, Rita and uh, Vittorio are our partners. I don't have the details. Uh, Laura? Yeah. Well, those that were partners or spouses uh, were killed together. They were in the same unit together, right? And I can't share which unit, okay? No. No, not that I'm aware of, but I can't, uh, I, again, I don't have any other details. I'm not aware of anybody else being present. I don't have those details now. Well, we asked the family to share the information and we've shared it to you just as they've shared it with us. Yeah, I gotta tell you, uh, I've been doing this for 34 years and this is, uh, probably one of the toughest days or a few days in my career um, as, a, as a police officer. Um, it's never easy. Uh, one is too many. But when you have to talk to, uh, or about in this case, five different families who are, you know, who are all have suffered this tragic loss over the last, you know, a couple of days ago here, um, it's, it's just extremely difficult and when you uh, you know, when you hear from the families talking about them as grandparents and as spouses and as fathers and, and, and grandfathers, I mean, you know, it's, it's about as bad as it gets uh, when, you, when, you're, when you're trying to communicate out on what happened, right? So, uh, you know, it, it, as a compassionate individual, as an organization that leads with compassion, which I believe we do, um, that's why it was extremely important for us to be here today to share um, some personal details about these about these folks because you know we talk sometimes collectively about victims as numbers right these are not numbers these are real human beings who lived long lives right and on a Sunday night were probably just in their homes like all of us were um, you know waiting to start the week and all of a sudden everything changed and so uh, to share personal details, to talk about uh, these uh, um, these people and their families. Yeah, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. It's really impactful, and uh, you know, we'll collectively do what we can to help them, and uh, that's what we do, right? But it's important that it's we all do that, and and reflect on these folks as we move forward, and um, and on what they're going to require moving forward to 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 help them, right? Well, our officers continue to reach out to the families, to work with the families. I mean, um, we have, as I mentioned yesterday, partnered uh, with, uh, you know, one of our key partners is Victim Services. So we're supporting the families through that process as well. Um, having a liaison officer assigned to each family. So with whatever they, they require or whatever they need, uh, we'll do our very best to, to support them. Um, 
but you know this is this is not something that you can do in a week or a month this is something that will take you know months and years right so it's the important piece is to do whatever we can to put whatever pieces in place to help them navigate what is next you know because there's a next day there's a next week and they're going to have to figure figure out well, how they how they move forward can i just ask why you want to do that again i mean you're supposed to speak at all about how the victims were targeted or whether no. they were targeted i can't speak to that yet Yeah, I can't talk about any further uh, details on the investigation. Um, as I said uh, before you arrived, today's main focus is about the victims, and let's keep it there for today. Um, whatever comes from the investigation will be shared at a later date with some further detail because I want to, as I mentioned yesterday, we want to be extremely accurate with the details so we're not having to correct things later. But for now, uh, I think it's just really important as we approach Christmas, we're in the middle of uh, Hanukkah, it's time to really think about how we help these people. You talked a little bit about how tough this is for you, but the officers that were there initially on the scene, have you had a chance to speak to them? Well, you know, I spoke to, uh, I spoke to some people uh, on the night of, right? Um, it's, it's extremely difficult, right? What I will say though is, uh, and I said it yesterday, you know, um, the, the, the interaction that happened likely saved other lives. I won't get into the details, but what I will say is, you know, we, we as police officers, right, because I was a frontline officer before as well, we strap on this uniform every day and we're entrusted to protect people. So <laughs> when our officers do just that, we have to thank them for the work they do. There's a tragedy here we're still dealing with, and again, I'm making about, you know, it's, it's about the victims, but, you know, our police officers, men and women, every day do this work and put their lives in harm's way, right? And it's important to understand that our officers go out every day to do that. And in, in this case, I believe uh, the officers did exactly what the community would expect of, their, of our officers, right? So- Don't usually. Uh, I'll leave it at that. I can't comment further, but uh, you know, I have a lot of faith in our people and I am very proud as a police chief, but also as a, a, a frontline member myself once to strap on this uniform every day and go out and do what we're paid to do. So um, I'll leave you with that unless there's any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, Con Ontario, a candlelit uh, Bagel is expected to take place tonight for the victims of the Toronto area condo shooting. York Regional Police say five people were killed and one woman seriously injured uh, on Sunday night. And a 35 year old gunman or 75 year old gunman went on a shooting rampage in his uh, Beihan condo building before he, uh, he was shot dead by police. <clears throat> the Vigo was slated to take place at the courtyard outside of. Bang and City Hall from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Mayor Steve Del Duca, Stephen Del Duca, is expected to deliver remarks and the city is asking attendees to bring a candle. <coughs> uh, police identified the victims as Rita Kim. And Laurie, uh, Vidiro, Anza, Russell, Manic, Alan Manic, Nadid, uh, Dada, Doran D. Nico's husband has identified her as the lone survivor of the 
shooting and says she's resting in the hospital after emergency surgery. Oh man, I'm getting tired. All right, let's talk about the uh, ban on Singu's plastics coming into effect on uh, December 20th, though. I guess it's already happening. As of today, companies can no longer produce or bring into Canada plastic grocery bags, cutlery, stir sticks, straws, and takeout containers, starting a one-year countdown to an outright ban on selling them. The manufacturing and import ban will extend to the plastic rings used to package six packs of canned drinks starting next June. Their sale will be prohibited a year after that. Many retailers have already made the switch with fabric reusable bags at Walmart checkouts and paper bags at the checkout at Sobeys. Now Tim Hortons has unveiled its recyclable fiber lid for hot beverages, which look the same as the current plastic version except recyclable. Tim's is doing a trial on the new lids in Vancouver before a full-scale rollout next year, along with wooden recyclable cutlery. For the City News <sighs> Business Center, I'm Mike Apple. It's almost lunchtime. And the funny thing is, is I don't actually think th this isn't going to solve anything. When it comes to plastic pollutions, get into that a little bit later, though. And uh, I got a little hungry, so I so I asked one of my producers to grab some stuff from the food court downstairs, and uh, let's see what she picked up. So inside this plastic bag, we've got a uh, clamshell container with my lunch in it. Uh, oh, she's got plastic cutlery. That's good. That'll be handy. We've got a little straw here. Got a coffee with some sugar and uh, stir stick. And just as I asked for, six pack of Coke. Perfect. With a, you know, one of these little ring carriers. So, so obviously this, this isn't actually my lunch. It, it's an environmentalist's worst nightmare. But the Canadian government wants to change that. I'm very happy to announce that as early as 2021, Canada will ban harmful single-use plastics from coast to coast to coast. Now I know what you're thinking. Andrew, how old is that clip? <laughs> Very. from 2019, and, and yes, it is now almost 2023. So actually implementing this single-use plastics ban did take the government longer than expected. But that ban goes into effect today. So there are now five categories of single-use plastics that can no longer be manufactured or imported for sale in Canada now. So stir sticks is one category. Cutlery is another, takeout containers, plastic grocery bags, and straws. Um, ring carriers, uh, they actually make up a sixth category, and that gets phased out a little bit later, um, June 20th of next year. Now, you will still see single-use plastics in use for the next year or so, because restaurants are allowed to use up the stock that they have, right? The, the, the plastic straws and the stir sticks and so on. So, otherwise, how do we measure the impact of this change? Well, the six categories represented an estimated 150,000 tons sold in 2019, or an estimated 3% of the total plastic waste generated in Canada in 2019. I wonder where that uh, other 97% of plastic waste is generated from. Hmm. I wonder where. Those are the government's own numbers. And it might make you wonder, like, why the focus on these things? Is this really tackling the world's plastic problem? No. Well, Peter Ross knows an awful lot more about that than I do. No, it doesn't. Um, like we've talked about time and time again, a vast majority of the plastic pollution uh, globally, uh, I think it's like 75% of it comes from... 100 companies, which is unsurprising in the slightest, and banning single-use uh, plastics on the consumer end doesn't actually solve the problem. Like it just wants us, it, like it just makes us feel like we're doing something, right? 
like it does have a tangible uh, effect on the environment granted it's like very fucking small but it does right and this isn't going to solve any any issues um again it just just uh makes us feel like we're doing something it's not actually solving any issues that uh come out of uh plastic pollution if we want to do that we would have to go after those corporations that are uh dumping absorbent amounts of plastics into uh, the ocean and other bodies of water i think of him like a like an expert on pollution a senior scientist at the rain coast conservation foundation plastic is all around us uh, in stores and in our consumer way of life it's there for safety it's there to, to create something durable and lightweight so there are obviously lots of benefits to us as canadians at the same time we don't want plastics getting into the environment and so that's what the government is balancing here trying to target those items that we don't really need uh, we have good replacements for uh, and it's going to prevent those items from getting into the ocean now peter told us that those what a fucking lib take no it's not going to be solving any of the problems <sighs> again 75 percent of the pollution is coming from um 100 companies that's what we need to be tackling what you think you substituting your fucking plastic straw for a paper one is going to actually res uh, resolve the fucking plastic pollution absolutely not it just makes fucking libs feel like they're actually doing something when in reality they're really not it's the exact same thing with like any other forms of fucking pollution like say greenhouse emissions for example Consumer, consumer-based plastics like it's a very small fucking percentage. That's actually behind uh, plastic pollution. It's not going to solve anything. To be perfectly honest. Those items, I mean these items here, they're the ones that often wash up on our shores. So the plastics being banned are a pretty visible part of the plastic waste problem, but. Like we said, it is only a small part of it, right? Another part is recycling. So of the 3 million tons of plastic that we throw away each year, only 9% is recycled. And that's, there's a reason for that. So when you see, um, So, I have a an, an empty Tums container here, right? On the bottom, it has the three arrows, not the like not the recycling uh, symbol. That's a completely different one. Um, with the letter or with the number five on it, right? So, this container cannot be recycled. is uh, they'll only recycle um, ones with either one or two on it, right? Now, manufacturers did this on purpose to confuse consumers, right? Because if we look at the recycling, um, at the recycling symbol,
this is what it looks like, right? This is what the recycling symbol looks like. It's the recycling symbol, what you see with the numbers, is a ploy by companies to pretend like they're doing something and confuse consumers into putting non-recyclable uh, materials into the um, into the system. Uh, I think uh, I think it was John Oliver had a really good video on on this whole thing because most of the recycling symbol you see is not the actual recycling symbol, so keep that in mind. Two things strike me as problematic with the re recycling system. One is that we're not allowed to recycle all plastics uh, for, for many reasons. And Yeah, like a big one is uh, mixing plastics. Like a vast majority of those plastics are either single use or mixed plastics, so we can't recycle them. Two is that those plastics that we do recycle, a lot of them are not usable in the marketplace, in the secondary marketplace. And so that's a really interesting point, right? Th this idea of a circular plastic economy where plastic products would ideally be you know, recycled and reused as packaging several times over. But a lot of the stuff that we think is recyclable actually does end up in landfills. And one good example of that is, is food packaging. So you know, if you imagine a, a plastic soda bottle, like as well as like can't have like food excrements on your uh recycling materials and not just like plastics either it goes for like cardboard stuff as well all kinds of things go into making that plastic like you have hardening agents softening agents even the dyes used to color the bottle and it makes it really hard to reuse in a way that's safe for humans so food manufacturers often have to use brand new plastic to make their packaging and there's a lot of packaging to make. What I've done uh, uh, on a couple of occasions when a supermarket is rel relatively quiet, I'll stop at the front of an aisle, I'll look down as far as my eyes will take me and try to discern the extent to which plastics have pervaded the pack. Yeah, like, um, so for context, um, when it comes down to recycling stuff i cannot recycle this because this has the number five but i can recycle this because it has a number of two i think it is potentially malicious companies uh do uh the numbering system to confuse uh, consumers and having to of course, the workers that are working at these facilities for recycling to have to put up with it because there are so much things that are, you are not allowed to recycle when it comes to plastics. Packaging sector in a supermarket, in a grocery store. And uh, it's, uh, it's positively uh, mind-blowing when one really thinks that almost every single package is either made of plastic or has plastic elements in it. And that fact, that, that plastic is everywhere in almost every part of our lives, is both a curse and a gift. When it comes to plastic, this is the first time that I've had a pollution example where every single Canadian, every single member of the public understands what I'm talking about. Why do they understand? Because everybody has seen plastic pollution. It's very visible, uh, often damaging, uh, certainly unsightly, uh, and not good in our natural world. If I can use plastics as an ambassador, as an indicator of uh, what uh, we can understand in ter terms of our impact of our uh, society on uh, the aquatic environment or the environment in general, uh, then I can uh, align uh, new allies in the general public uh, to better protect the environment. This is a small step, but it is an important step, and it gives us confidence that this conversation is not going to end with a single-use plastic ban. And to be clear, you know, this ban was never meant to be the end. Just one step in the government's stated goal of zero plastic waste by 2030.
Yeah, good luck. That will not happen. Today marks the turning point. No more use it and lose it. It's time to turn off the tap on single-use plastic pollution. I'm happy to announce that the Government of Canada has moved forward a comprehensive plan to ban harmful single-use plastics and keep them out of the environment. Today, we are publishing the single-use plastics prohibition regulations, which deliver on our commitment to prohibit certain harmful single-use plastic items, the ones we most often find littering our streets and other public spaces. These items include checkout bags, cutlery, hard to recycle takeout containers, ring carriers, stir sticks, and straws. We estimate that once in effect, the regulations will eliminate over 1.3 million tons of hard to recycle plastic products from going into- The funny thing is, is like, when it comes to like plastic cutlery and um, like plastic bags and like Tupperware container that you get from like, I don't know, Pizza Hut. Like that stuff, like even to a certain point, plastic straws, like people reuse them, right? Like we use, reuse like plastic color here. It's plastic, it's plastic takeout containers. For the most part, like most households will reuse a vast majority of that stuff. ...to landfills, as well as more than 22,000 tons of plastic pollution in the wider environment over 10 years. That's equivalent to over a million full garbage bags worth of litter. In drafting these regulations, we aim to strike a balance between reducing single-use plastics and ensuring that Canadians have access to the products they need to live well. This is... The announcement on planetary health delayed by a pandemic. This decision is supported by science. It will keep our environment clean and wildlife healthy. The ban on styrofoam takeout boxes and many plastic items, including bags, cutlery and straws, isn't new. But the timing is, as of December, none can be imported or made for use in Canada. And as of next December, you won't be able to buy any. Our ultimate goal is zero plastic waste. A lot of people seem to be on side. You know, I shouldn't be allowed to do this right now. I mean, it's, you know, I just got away with it. Once you have to hold stuff in your hands a couple times, you'll remember to bring your reusable bag. <laughs> It can be trickier for some small businesses. This restaurant has already replaced most of its cutlery for indoor dining, but Uber takeouts require the use of plastic bags. Ten times more per bag, so we're talking maybe from uh, four or five cents for a plastic bag to 50, 60 cents for a paper bag. Hopefully between now and 2023, the people who uh, have decided to implement um, this policy We'll also maybe try and find a way to ensure that small businesses like us are provided with cost-effective uh, options. The plastics industry says it should be allowed to recycle more of them. Why not allow industry the time to show that through investment, through innovation... Because, half, because over half of the plastics that we use cannot be recycled. It's literally only two out of the seven. We can actually have one of the most robust recycling systems in the world. But environmental groups say the ban should come sooner. There are a number of items that we know, um, you know, sh regularly show up in shoreline cleanups and community cleanups across Canada. Ottawa says it could add more items to the banned list. For now, Canadian manufacturers will still be allowed to export single-use plastics until 2025. Oh yeah, that's solving the problem. A plan to seriously reduce plastic waste in Canada began to take shape today. The federal government says the end is coming for these single-use plastics. Plastic grocery bags, straws, stir sticks, six-pack rings for cans, plus cutlery and some food containers. It's part of the government's push to achieve zero plastic waste by 2030. Mike Lecouture looks at what's in the plan and what's been left out. 
The owners of this Ottawa cafe pride themselves on being environmentally friendly. The pandemic paused their discount program for people who brought their own cups and dishes. And to survive, they had to grow the takeout side of the business. We had to adapt and therefore increase our amount of takeout containers. So we use them quite a lot. We do try to stick to recycled materials, but sometimes that's just not possible. And now she's facing the prospect of a ban on those lower cost containers as they try to deal with declining revenues and increasing costs due to COVID-19. You might as well just shut us down, to put it blatantly, because if you're going to give us the demand that it has to be a recycled material, then you should probably make it more cost effective for us. Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson She's right. contends the proposed ban only affects a small percentage of plastic products that can't be recycled, adding it's part of a bigger plan to increase the country's recycling capacity. Canadians throw away more than three tons of plastic every year. Only 9% of it is recycled. And to be honest, I mean, we are, we are not leading the world in this. Uh, this is exactly the same kind of approach that many countries in Europe, including the United Kingdom, have gone down this path. Environmentalists say Canada should be more ambitious than the European Union, even though it's considered the gold standard for recycling. Setting low targets does no one any favors. If you're setting a low target because you think you admit that this material cannot be collected and it cannot be recycled, well, that's a justification for not using it. Now, the proposed plan comes a day after Alberta unveiled its pro-plastic plan which includes more manufacturing and making the province a recycling hub. We have to ensure that it does not interfere with our ability to grow the economy. The federal environment minister said the yeah. two plans dovetail perfectly because it will increase our recycling capacity, adding plastics will always be part of the economy. The goal is to keep them out of the environment. Donna? All right, Mike Lecatur in Ottawa, thank you. Now we're all aware of the harmful effects of plastic and it is the most hazardous material if you are using single-use plastic products as of now. In a bid to control the damage such uh, that is caused by plastics to the environment, Canada has now laid out certain final regulations. How did an wipe off get in here, man? I mean, I, I guess we'll watch it. Outlining how it intends to apply a ban on plastic bags, straws, containers and other single-use items. The Liberal government is now targeting the year 2030 to eliminate all plastic waste from ending up in landfills or as litter on beaches, rivers, wetlands and forests. According to Canada's health minister, a total of 43,000 tons of single-use plastics every year finds its way into the environment, especially in the waterways. Canada is currently looking to ban six types of items. These include single-use plastic bags, cutlery, straws, stir sticks, carrier rings and takeout containers. The ban on manufacturing and import of all these items will begin from December 2022. Canada further aims to completely ban the export of single-use plastic by the end of 2025, further making it the first among peer jurisdictions to do so internationally. However, the re regulations have a few notable exceptions. To name some, retailers will be allowed to sell single-use plastic flexible straws if they are packaged alongside a beverage container. According to a study, less than one-tenth of the plastic waste Canadians produce is recycled, which means that 3.3 million tons of plastic was thrown out annually. In the year 2018, Canada had led the creation of International Oceans Plastic Charter, which has been signed by 28 countries. The pledge includes steps to reduce plastic usage and to work with the industry to increase rates of plastic recycling. Watch this. I think we watched this when it came out actually. Okay, then. Here we go. Two more of. Uh, more articles in it. I'm going call it and probably go to bed. Starting Tuesday, Canada will ban the manufacture for sales of single-use plastics and an effect to achieve zero plastic waste by 2030 according to the environment and climate change of Canada. The ban covers single-use plastic bags, including bags, cutlery, food container, uh, uh, food service ware, ring carriers, stir sticks and straws. The federal government st uh, stated in a news release published 
20th. Well, the ban on the manufacturer, the manufacture and import of single-use plastics will come to an end and come to effect on Tuesday. The sale of these items will be prohibited as of December 2023. Allow well, businesses in Canada enough time to transition and to complete their existing stock according to the government's website. ban on manufacture and import of carrier rings often used for so will go into force in June 2020. In addition, Canada will also prohibit the export of plastics in the same six categories by the five. Every year Canadians throw out at least Three million tons of plastic waste, with only nine percent being recycled, and the rest ending up in a landfill. Waste to energy facility is for nature, according to Environment Canada. Canada's single-use plastic ban is an important step. It could eliminate an estimated 1.3 million tons of plastic waste annually. That is hard to recycle, said Juan Jose Elavid, or Elava, research associate, associate the Ocean Pollution Research Unit at the University of British Columbia. Excuse me. Canada must go beyond banning single use. Sticks in order to reach its goal, not zero plastic waste, he said. There is more to be done to combat plastic pollution that meets the eye, said Alava. Alava said he thinks the next step should be looking for solutions to try to eliminate plastic bottles and chemicals that are used for the production of the production and manufacture of plastics. However, federal efforts aren't enough, said Alava. Canadians should also try to do their best to reduce the use of plastics in their everyday life. It's important that in addition to these, a national ban, every person, every household, also contribute a bit to make a difference by changing our behavioral preferences, our footprint in terms of plastic. Lava. Uh, Jay Ying Zhao, Associate Professor, Department of Psychology and the Institute of Research Environment Sustainability at the University of Columbia said he, she thinks the single-use plastic pen is a good policy, but its efficacy depends on the enforcement and implementation of alternative materials. Because we have a ban in place doesn't mean the single-use Plastics will be reduced, said no. The Canada Research Chair in Behavioral Sustainability. Some businesses provide single use plastic, they might think, then obviously people are going to, not going to use plastics like cups and straws and bags and containers, said so. According to and adding that the effectiveness of the ban will depend on both whether there is a consequence for not following it and the cost of switching to not single plastic items. Bags are bags that are plastic manufactured items and those contained, contained 
fabric, but break tear or tear easily. Period according to see uh, technical guidelines. Are plastic bags that are usually to customers for carrying goods from businesses and those who work. Those used to carry and deliver takeout food or drinks from restaurants. However, plastic bags are not uh, plastic bags that are used with garbage and recycled items are not prohibited under the new ban. Plastic bags used uh, to package fruits and bulk food items such as candy, nuts, and nuts meats, flour, plants, clothing, baked goods are also allowed. I mean, that's the way to solve that issue. So think it's uh, plastics like Lombro. The government requires fabric checkout bags that are used to replace single use plastic bags that are durable, uh, meaning they will not break or tear if it's to carry 10 kilograms over a distance of four times and capable of being washed on a laundry machine. And it all bans the use of plastic forks, knives, spoons, forks, or chopsticks that contain polyester and polyethane. Changes properties after dishwasher 100 times. Usable uh, plastic cutlery not made from polyester polyethylene. Uh, and will stand being loud. Two containers and cups that are made or import plastic are banned. Those that contain expanded polyester uh, extruded polyester foam, polyvinyl chloride and black plastic through a partial or incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons and oxidable stick. Canadians will also not be to use uh, by single use plates tools after the fitted on the sale on sale of two fourth in December twenty twenty three. So I imagine this is just gonna be the same for this six trays used for storing for meat, fish and vegetables film and from plastic touching pet are not affected. It's not clear anything. It's kind of like they're throwing the consumers under the bus or something. Ban is not effective, uh, affecting containers. Storage of food such as peanut butter, applesauce, olives, or nuts. Cups are containers used by hospitals and institutions for providing patient to patients are also not prohibited and fiber based coffee cups with a plastic lining and uh, that do not contain one or uh, of the prohibited plastics or recyclable service wear that are made from non prohibited kinds of recycled Plastics, non-conventional or possible uh, plastics are also allowed. Uh, Manufacture of single-use plastic rim carriers that are 
designed surround beverage containers to carry them together and in June 20 plastic green containers can be stretched out to shape have typically been made of uh, density layer thin. However, rigid plastic beverage container rigid plant uh, beverage container pivoted as they do not have or bands surrounding the beverage containers. Uh, the restrictions on the import and manufacture green containers will come into effect in June 23. A full ban on sales later than later. All types of plastic stir sticks, uh, which are designed to stir beverages, a ban in Canada. Stir sticks that are designed to prevent a beverage spilling or dripping out of the lid. A cup are also banned. Plastic drinking straws that contain polyester. Cannot stand going through terms of prohibition. Plastic straws that are attached to soldiers' boxes, bags, uh, pouches, also prohibited. Manufacture and import of single use flexible straws, which are single use plastic straws. Bendable, contain. Uh, their position at various angles flexible straws are considered more accessible than straight straws as they position. Canadians are, are allowed to uh, offer single-use plastic uh, straws to offer others in uh, a family social situation, hospital facilities, and other institutions are allowed to offer plastic flexible straws to their patients or residents. Under the new bans, selling or selling uh, plastic straws is a complicated in which retailers to keep stable. Uh, oh, customers sell them much of single use to one customer plus retail. Beverage containers with a plastic foot stick. When requesting a uh, six flux straws from a retail but patient just them stores prior to ask customers accessibility uh, accessibility needs. It's gonna be for me. Um getting kind of tired. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot to cover. All right. Well, thanks for everyone's just stopping by. I'll see everyone later.